point of reflection to start with. Thank you. So at this point in time, uh, anybody who has a disclosure of pecuniary interest can do it now or at any point in time through the meeting. And if I could have a motion to confirm the agenda, moved by Walter, second by Bob Wilhelm. Those in favor? Those in favor? Carried. Oh, we got Rhonda on the screen there now. Okay. Sorry, Emily. Okay, good. Uh, next, we have consent agenda. We have items 5.1 to 5.8. Does anyone want to see anything pulled or discussed from that? I see Rhonda. Uh, I would like uh, 5.4 pulled Mapleton uh, requests. And I'd also like to make a comment on 5.2. Uh, Perth East should be in, included in that Enbridge natural gas uh, study because it's right on the boundary road between Perth East and Perth South. And we did get a letter uh, in Perth East about 10 days later about it. So just so everyone knows we're, we're in part of that. Okay. But you don't want 5.2 pulled, you just want 5.4? Uh, correct. Okay, so we'll take 5.4 out. So I have a motion to approve percentage of items 5.1 to 5.8 with 5.4 being removed for further discussion and to approve the April 16th, 2020 council amendments. Moved by. I see Todd and I see you. Those in favor? That would be carried. Okay, public meetings, public hearings, delegations. Oh, 5.4. Do you want to do that now then, Rhonda? Or we can do it later? Okay. We'll do it now. 5.4. Sure. Okay. okay. Um, I, I think we should be supporting this. Um, this is how years ago the taxes were uh, for farms were done this way. We paid it, then the government reimbursed us. They got this idea to reimburse it then through the municipality. And I'm not sure that the municipality is getting the fair share of that uh, amount. So I think we should encourage the government to go back to the way it was before and, and make sure we do get our fair share. Todd? Generally speaking, I, I agree that there's a problem with the taxation system. As you know, um, we represented this matter to the Minister of Finance uh, a year ago and a bit at the AMO conference. Um, Warden McKenzie and I were in attendance at that and uh, made many of the same points that this uh, letter is making. Uh, at the same time, um, as you probably, many of you know, I'm an advocate for much uh, further um, consideration of this matter. I think personally that uh, uh, the province needs to look at municipal funding on the income tax as opposed to um, using property tax. And so um, this this solution is is a partial solution in my opinion. And, um, and there are many reasons why um, we need to have the province evaluate whether municipal funding uh, should be attached to the income tax as opposed to property tax. I will support um, Mayor Eggett's motion, but I, um, I make it plain that uh, I have a different agenda still and and, uh, and intend to pursue that further uh, at an appropriate date. Walter, did I see your hand up? Well, I, I would support uh, Rhonda's motion as well. Uh, there's, um, and we did make this point, as Todd said, when we talked to the uh, um, uh, Minister of Finance, um yeah like the old way i think was far better and and uh, um, this way the uh, uh, municipalities uh, uh basically had their uh, their money up front um now uh, it's a, just a total different system and, and leaves a bit to uh, to be desired so i i would support uh, rana's motion anybody else with comments i see matt duncan Uh, this has been an issue since I came on council two terms ago with North Perth. It's just now that many of the other municipalities are seeing the OMPF cuts that they're actually realizing what North Perth's been going through for a number of years now. And 
asking the province to fix for us. Uh, and it seemed we always fell on deaf ears. So I'm fully in support of sending this letter to the province and asking them to take another look at this. Anybody else with questions or comments up there? Not seeing any coming up. So I need a motion to support the resolution by the Township of Minto, was it? Uh, Mapleton. Mapleton? Yeah, and we'll send a letter. And forward it on to the province in support of that motion. Moved by Rhonda, second by you, McDermott. Those in favor? Carry. Perfect. Okay. Moving on. CAO office. Appointment of clerk. And before we get into that, Laurie, you just turn that camera there just a tiny little bit. And I'm going to have Laurie introduce you to our new person because he's actually sitting here. There, go. there we go. <laughs> okay. So um, thank you. And through the warden, good morning, uh, county council and staff. So we do have a report on here and the resolution in the report is just to receive it. And then when you get to your bylaw section at the end of the agenda, there is a housekeeping amendment, a housekeeping appointments bylaw uh, to appoint the clerk because they are appointed by bylaw uh, pursuant to the municipal act. And at the same time, while you're appointing uh, Tyler Sager as the clerk, you will be removing that from myself and just appointing me as a deputy clerk. So um, it is a housekeeping bylaw. It is necessary to do it. And um, I am pleased to be able to introduce you to Tyler Seger. And he did start last week, but until you do the appointment, um, it's not official that he is appointed as the clerk. And he has, uh, he is a relatively local um, individual to Perth County uh, with municipal experience in both the large and small municipality. Recently, he comes to us from Central Huron as the deputy clerk. So if you just want to say hello to County Council and how happy you are to be here. <laughs> yeah, uh, good morning, uh, Council. And uh, as Lori said, I am happy to be here. Uh, looking forward to the challenges and uh, excited to uh, get moving. Perfect. Thank you. So we will go to the next. So, I, I, so actually, we have a motion that Council receives the appointment slash clerk report. So I need a mover and a seconder. That would be moved by you, second by Doug Eight. Those in favor? Carry. Perfect. Now we'll move on again. CEMC slash COVID-19 update. Laura. Okay, so that's me. So that's I'll just you. go to that report. One second, I'm sorry. Sorry. So thank you. The CEMC would have liked to have been here this morning. However, he is in uh, an ECG meeting for the town of St. Mary's. So I just indicated to him, I will uh, send his regrets to County Council and I will uh, present his report for him. It simply is an information uh, report. Um, so Council is updated on his activities. The I can tell you most recently, as of yesterday, another activity for the CEMC, and it's an important one. We met with all the area CAOs uh, for all of Perth County, the seven CAOs, and um, some of the alternate CEMCs to discuss um, the process moving forward into the recovery phase uh, when we're ready to, to move to that next step. And um, it was very well received. It's a formal document. Uh, we will distribute that out to County Council so they can see uh, how the section in the uh, approved municipal emergency management plan um, plays out in terms of process so that County Council still uh, will receive all of the information coming up through the ECG. So um, it's, it's a technical document, uh, but a lot of work went into it and it was very well received from the area CAOs. So I just wanted to pass that on. Um, I'm not sure if there's any uh, questions from the report, simply for their information. Todd. Um, I will point out that uh, 
Um, he participated in North Perth ECG meetings uh, fairly regularly and strangely seemingly aligned with the Perth East ECG meetings in his written report. So I'm wondering if he in fact uh, made an error in his uh, entries in his uh, date log for um, uh, this report. Uh, yes, through the warden, I um, apologize for missing that. Uh, yes, the report will be updated to reflect that he was in fact participating in the North Perth as well. So he participates in uh, the county, the four uh, municipalities, member municipalities, as well as the town of St. Mary's at this time. We will make that correction. Any other questions or comments? Bob Wilhelm. Uh, Lori, I believe that there was supposed to be a discussion about holding the meetings every two weeks yesterday. Uh, was that, uh, in fact, discussed then? What was the res uh, decision? Thank you. Through the warden, yes, it was discussed, and there will be a um, an update to your meeting planner. We will be moving to every second Monday. Uh, now, that lines up with the holidays, so your next uh, combined ECG meeting, which will um, give you the updates from all the uh, shared services as well, will be held on the Tuesday following the long weekend. And uh, then it will go back to uh, the Monday, but it'll be every second week. So we did agree on that yesterday, so we will be sending that out later today. And just further to that, the province did extend the emergency until the 19th of May yesterday? Yes, correct? yes, as I understand it, yes. Okay. Any other questions up there on the screen? Not seeing any hands, not seeing any green buttons. I have a motion that Perth County receives the COVID-19 CEMC update for information. Moved by Doug Kellum, seconded by Matt Duncan. All in favor? Gary, perfect. Moving on, planning promotion activity update. Uh, we had Sally there once. Yeah. I don't see her at the very moment. There she is. Okay, there we go. Thanks, Sally. Okay. Um, development review has been quite busy throughout the um, last six weeks and, and has really picked up in the last few. Um, our transition to get some additional help from a consultant on the development work is now complete and they're well underway. So um, that process has definitely underlined the value of having written protocols and procedures for the work that we do. And in the no sorry, in the east and the west, you can expect either Pierre or Evan to be showing up later this month or early June with with new consent applications uh, for you. So um, we have 32 active files right now, and uh, one of those is the. Um, official plan amendment initiated by council about the surplus farm residence efforts and I'm I'm pointing that one out or bringing it up because I did receive correspondence on it after the council meeting where we last talked about it and that was from the Perth County Federation of Agriculture and I just wanted to report that since then um, I've had good discussions with them about um, the questions that they had and we had a really um, positive outcome from that discussion so uh, things were um, uh, concerns or confusions were cleared up and now um, I think we have pretty good um, feedback from them about moving forward with that with that one um, pre consultations have also been sort of markedly uh, increased I, I would say uh, we have a pretty active uh, agenda on those and that's indicating to me that the community development community is still working on projects and springtime um, wave of applications, I guess, is still uh, likely to happen. So that makes the importance of figuring out virtual public meetings um, more important and certainly something we've been working on lately. Uh, the strategy that we're um, working through includes um, our intention to have it a webinar-based session where people can follow along with um, information on the screen and see the participants. Uh, I want to be able to offer a telephone opportunity for people. Um, 
perhaps that would be uh, beforehand where they could call in and we would transcribe their their questions or comments or during. We haven't quite nailed down the mechanics of that one yet. And certainly, as always, written opportunities for people to submit comments. So a few of the th things that I wanted to ensure we um, have fully considered with our public meetings is the ability of people, uh, I mean, the essence of a public meeting is that you come and you learn more about the application and you hear other people's comments and you have the opportunity to interact with those comments and then maybe even develop your own um, additional comments somewhat on the fly. And uh, many of the options that I've seen don't really allow for that. And that's something that I would like to fully work out or at least fully consider before we nail down our operating procedure and how we want to do virtual public meetings. And I do think that um, with some technological um, introducing technology to these meetings, it, it, it might be prudent in the short term at least to offer people more time to prepare. So I was I'm considering uh, extending notice periods by a full week. Um, so a consent would have a two week notice period and now uh, a three week period would be something that um, I would bring out you know, bring forward in the in the proposed protocol um, to get to get people more time to to uh, figure out how they're going to and how they're going to participate. Those are uh, those are the considerations underway right now in, in planning for public meetings. The uh, new official plan continues to be a large project on our work plan and something that is getting um, uh, getting attention constantly. Uh, the comprehensive review that you all reviewed last meeting um, has been sent out to the uh, lower tier municipalities via the clerks. And I did send it directly to um, some specific uh, folks in the development community that asked for it. Um, they asked for it before it was prepared. And so when it, it was ready, I forwarded it to them. I do expect actually the document itself in the next few weeks, um, and then we'll be able to begin some internal review on that. And mapping also continues. So I have been a I have been offering um, sort of less of my attention to mapping in the last couple of weeks, just as we get the development work uh, transferred and up and and rolling along. And so um, now we'll be able to shift that back to uh, have a much stronger focus in my day to day. And uh, the other thing underway is certainly the planning um, planning service model review. And um, I have been to three of the four lower tier municipalities offering an update on that process and where we're at. And I, d I had a really positive experience at all three. Um, and I had great questions from council members at all three as well. So um, lots of interest and um, general um, positive comments towards the progress uh, and the direction that that's heading. Um, lot, and lots of work uh, left to do on that one. So um, the thing that I've been working on a lot this week is the nailing down like what the work plan looks like so that we can make sure we get through all of the details that are required for that process um, through the spring and summer and just getting the first few reports underway for our next meeting. And that's the planning update that I have for you today. Thanks, Sally. Questions for Sally? Uh, Good morning, Sally. Um, thank you for your report. Could you unpack a little bit for us uh, the mapping activities and explain what types of maps uh, you're producing, that kind of thing? Because certainly I'm aware of the fact that County Council, through the official plan process, has seen extensive, uh, apparently, mapping GIS stuff related to that natural heritage plan. So I'm trying to understand um, what's happening with mapping and, and why we're still hearing about it. Yeah, the mapping process for an entirely new official plan means, um, I, I guess I'll, I'll respond to your comments specifically about natural heritage in that I'm, I haven't been focusing on that mapping in particular. I'm really trying to get the other maps put together. So in our official plan, we have uh, schedules and those include all the designations for all the properties in the county and a lot of that uh, nomenclature is out of date and um, so it is really going back to figure out uh, what everything really is and if it's still got an appropriate name and if that matches the the characteristics of the property itself 
so lots of record, for instance, that are really close to settlement areas um, that are zoned or designated agriculture. Does it make sense for those still to be agriculture? And that is part of a bigger conversation around boundary adjustments. So we're looking at every settlement area and looking at all the properties um, on the inside of the boundary and the outside of the boundary, but on the periphery and trying to figure out the, the characteristics of those properties that might make them good candidates to either come in or actually to be like taken out of a settlement area. And we do have individual property owners making requests. So we're trying to marry those requests with uh, planning principles and see whether there's boundary adjustments for those villages, hamlets, and the serviced um, areas. And then of course, there's the, there's the, through the comprehensive review, we have two settlement areas that need um, outright expansion. And so it's the same sort of exercise in figuring out where best to expand those. And the underlying work that has to happen is making sure that we have all good data in our system so that when we actually create the maps and the inventories that kind of go along with the maps to tell the story of why something's designated one way or another, that um, the data underneath them is completely up to date and is uh, easily, uh, easily used or easily called upon um, to inform us. And some of those data sets have, um, have not been updated over time. And so Gary's been working really hard to make sure that, for instance, we have all the servicing data laid out so we know exactly where um, all the sanitary servicing is right now and where it's planned to be. And that that's in the database in a really clean format that we can call upon and have um, and really rely upon. So that's a lot of the mapping work that's been happening to date as well as conversations about boundary adjustments and where to where to go with those. And so um, the maps that will be produced in the end are going to be, uh, there's gonna be a lot of maps that sort of, that show the proposed boundary, uh, the proposed new, new boundaries of settlement areas. And um, there will also be uh, some, some story to go along with those maps about uh, how the nomenclature has changed and why. And so there is quite a bit of work to do uh, in the mapping, not only to make it um, to make it good for our new schedules that will be in the new plan, but also to to prepare us to tell the story to the public and help them understand um, what the designations mean and how they're how it affects individual properties, and to be able to prepare for those public engagement sessions that we'll be having later on in the year. So there are. Um, there are maps that will end up in the plan itself, and then there are maps that we do to help people understand and explain. So there's lots of like before and after type stuff, or maps that show um, the existing the existing designations, but then the new ones are shown in a different symbology. So it's about um, information sharing right now too, as well as as well as really investigating the the adjustment of boundaries. Todd? Just one quick supplementary uh, so that I understand the process that lies ahead with regards to uh, North Perth as, as has been established in uh, uh, various reports that have come forward. There is probably a need for additional land allocation for uh, residential purposes. Uh, I take note in the past, uh, um, earlier in our process when there were reports that came forward that spoke to um, uh, various swaps of land designations in Perth East. And, um, and so my question relates to um, the degree of consultation with which planning approaches local councils with regards to their impressions and desires about allocation of new lands for residential purposes. Yeah, so my first um, plan of action and some that's underway is to work with your local planner who has a good sense of uh, recent development interest and uh, potential swaps that have been talked about over time. And certainly a good handle on the different constraints on the land base on the periphery of a boundary. And so um, we would together formulate like a proposed boundary and then we can bring that around to your council um, to, dis to have discussion before, um, before public consultation. 
and to br to get your insights on that before um, formally bringing it to the public. It, in doing so, certainly the public gets to see sort of a, sort of a precursor to what is being considered. Any other questions, Bob Wilhelm? Yes, uh, thank you, Sally. I see that you've engaged uh, M. HBC to assist in your planning uh, and there looks like they're mainly uh, working on for Perth East and West Perth and my question is will their billing uh, be allocated to the proper municipalities yeah that's a great question so their um, their billing is going to be specific to applications so every time I get an invoice from them it's going to be application specific and I'll know very clearly where the work was done. Um, I'm going to let Corey speak to how they will be paid out and how they will be recovered. Um, so just the recovery of them would be through the application fee uh, that we have on them. Um, so and this is also being reviewed um so through uh we will show it as expense in our um in planning division and then their uh, application fee would offset the cost further questions bob so uh it's not total cost recovery and uh <clears throat> the county would be picking up uh, a large portion of their uh billing then because our application fees do not cover, or unless you can correct me, will not cover their their billing. And uh, I feel that uh, the municipality that's getting the work done by them uh, should pick up the balance. Current application fees, and I, my understanding is those are being uh, looked at for review. Um, so when they come back, so currently, yes, uh, but down in the future, it should cover the cost of it of the um, um, overall expense. Rhonda? Well, my understanding that we hired this firm to help us is because the planning department needed help and they're working on behalf of the county. So it shouldn't matter which municipality they're doing the work in. They're doing it for the municipality. So the municipality needs to pick up the bill, not the lower tier uh, municipalities. Sally? I just wanted to point out that um, along Rhonda's point, or uh, Mayor Agus's point, is that the, um, the service that they're providing in us is an extension of the work that we do already. And um, they are actually filling in the place of the person that, uh, that we lost. So we did go down one staff member, and this is to help fill that void in the short term. So it's a temporary arrangement where they're filling in for um, for one less staff person on our team that we would normally be paying. Other questions on the screen? I'm not seeing any. So just a kind of a comment now that we've got no more questions. Mm -hmm. Basically what it is is a continuation of the service is the way it is today. Mm -hmm. Part of your planning review process, and we haven't just got as far along as we had hoped, but we're getting there. So part of that process will be to readdress the fees and to make it more cost recovery. But at this point, we haven't got there yet, but that is the intended direction of which we're going. Any further questions after I make that comment? Not seeing any. So I have a motion. The county council receives the planning activity report. Moved by Daryl. Second by Todd. Those in favor? Gary. Thank you. Economic development. COVID report. Mayor. Thanks. Alex. Good morning. Oh. You're on, Meredith. Thank you. Good morning, uh, County Council. I just, I have a, a few reports here today. So I just wanna, I'll be very quick. 
I promise I won't waste your time. I know you guys are really busy. So I just wanted to give a quick update on what we've been working on in response to uh, COVID-19. Um, and just wanted to reassure the County Council that we are committed to our business community and we are working diligently to address the um, ever-changing needs um, of our businesses and our tourism program. So we leapt into action immediately on uh, uh, March 19th and launched a survey so we could collect some data from our businesses. We had 258 responses from businesses across the county. Uh, just in what we could do to better support them and make good choices uh, as we move forward throughout this unprecedented time. So we ran a first survey. That survey was then also picked up and was the benchmark for the Western Ontario Wardens Caucus. Only nine member municipalities through the Western Ontario Wardens Caucus uh, uh, completed that survey with their business community. Uh, we then did a second survey. Uh, it closed uh, on Friday of last week. Uh, we've already uh, tabulated the results. I, I sent that off to you guys yesterday. Um, and all the all both surveys are being uh, submitted to the federal and provincial um, policymakers, the ones who are making decisions for our business community. So we are uh, getting some fairly positive feedback from uh, both federal and provincial counter uh, our counterparts. Uh, appreci very appreciative of the rural data that they are getting. The second survey was all, again picked up by the Western Ontario Wardens Caucus and all 14 member municipalities participated in that survey. So we're going to have more robust data from that um, again which is good. It's just taking longer for the Western Ontario Wardens Caucus to uh, to summarize all of that data. They're hoping to have it uh, pushed up to the the feds and the province by the end of this week. So I, I think Walter and I do have a meeting tomorrow. So hopefully we'll have an update from that. Um, from the survey, we then uh, developed our action plan. So we started a landing, as you all know, a landing page for uh, business resources. So that was helping businesses uh, find the appropriate grants money and the loans that they that they needed to continue and to support their businesses. We then launched an online training uh, uh, class for businesses to get uh, themselves set up on e-commerce. So we launched that um, and it was completed on April 10th. So uh, we, eight opportunities, businesses were required to participate in four of the sessions uh, to complete the package. This was a free service that the county, um, uh, the economic development paid for through their business retention program budget line item. We had overwhelming response of businesses as you can see the data is shown. Um, in my report, uh, we also, this was a continuation, the timing just kind of, uh, it, it worked out well. It was a continuation, the intercultural competency training with Fanshawe College. This was a continuation on from last year's project that we did uh, for newcomers. So we also, we were launching, planning on launching that in March. So we just rolled with it and we've had uh, a, a um, not as a, we've had a positive uptake on it. I'd like to see more businesses uh, take it, but the businesses that have uh, signed up for the licenses have uh, have indicated that this has been a great opportunity for their staff to uh, do some online training while they're trying to figure out these uncharted waters. So um, that was, uh, that was uh, promising for sure. Uh, we then ran our 19 days and 19 ways campaign and then from that it's spinned off into 19 days in action and now we're developing a 19 days passport. So that uh, that marketing campaign has been very successful uh, and very well received. Uh, we've actually had several uh, mem uh, municipalities across the province of Ontario reach out to us and ask us if we could uh, if they could uh, use our information and obviously we shared that because that's the right thing to do. We've been doing spotlights on our businesses, uh, keeping our business directory up to date, encouraging businesses to continue um, to update um, uh, their COVID response and what they're doing to pra uh, for sales, to practice social distancing, curbside pickup, etc. cetera. Uh, we're currently working on a program, a local love program uh, that we're going to be uh, uh, providing some support and some some promotional mater materials for our businesses. So more to come on that later next week. Uh, as you saw, we've done a few different video series. There's another series coming out, uh, a frontline essential worker thank you is gonna be launched on Friday. Um, we are doing our how-to at home. So the first one was launched on Wednesday, uh, how to make fondue. So uh, really just opportunities to keep our 
residents and our business community engaged and reminding them that our business community are the ones that sponsor our kids sports teams they're our neighbors they're our friends they're the ones that we go to when we need swag um, and we we want more than ever them for them to be supported so we're just trying to come up with creative ways to keep people thinking um, local 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 and uh, so you know through our through different videos our bingos were a really uh, big success um, and that's kind of a, a quick update on our COVID-19 response for economic development. If there's any questions on that staff report, I'd happily answer them. Questions for Meredith? Todd? Thanks, Meredith, for the report. Um, during uh, my consultation with business and agriculture yesterday, I um, referenced the uh, survey results, the phase two survey results, and um, I was uncertain about whether those are public information. So uh, I'd like to inquire about the intention, uh, whether the county intends to release uh, that, those reports on the surveys that were conducted as public information. Thanks for your question, Todd. And this has been a struggle I have and my team have been going back and forth with. Currently, we've only been sharing them with uh, our stakeholders and our county councillors and then the province and the, uh, the federal government. Um, I'm not, I'm not, every day I change my mind that I want to share it publicly, but then I'm not sure that I want to share it publicly. So, uh, Sarah has been working on trying to, um, uh, aggregate the data that it's, uh, less, um, visible on who might be fill it, who might've completed the survey. So I'm happy to take thoughts and comments on that. Cause I am, I am struggling i do want to share the data but I, I i'm very aware that i don't want um anyone to be able to point out that that was so-and-so's business who was struggling or and i also don't want to have negative repercussions from our survey our business community trusts us a lot they've taken a lot of time to fill out those surveys so it is a bit of a uh, it's been it's been a struggle so i'm i'd love feedback on that comments from counselors up there well, just so that you know, I, I did I did reference the survey with business owners and agriculture interests. I did share some of the highlights that I saw from that survey. So um, I do, uh, you know, if, if that was a mistake, I'll own that. Um, but at the same time, uh, I think that there's useful data there. Um, it may be that the appendices which show the verbatims uh, could be removed or summarized in some way um to uh, give less specific data that might point at specific businesses um, having some professional experience with that challenge though i'll admit it's not necessarily easy no and i i yeah i agree 100 percent with you and absolutely we have been sharing as businesses um have asked us and uh, business associations have asked us for the da data we have been giving high level summaries so um again removing the information of the actual line by line items and uh just providing that high level so that's probably what we're going to end up doing um i just haven't wrapped my head around how that's going to look like right yet uh uh, will you be uh, doing uh, um, lower tier municipality slices of that data set and issuing that information to uh, the lower tiers so that we can see how our own local businesses responded? So unfortunately, uh, we can't break it out by uh, member municipalities. There was only the one question that indicated what municipality they were from. We are work we were working off an old um, survey monkey account so it, unfortunately we can't break it down per municipality other comments from counselors bob wilhelm i agree with todd that if you could uh, summarize it meredith i think it's an excellent uh, report and a job well done and i think it would be great if you could share it uh, throughout the businesses and residents of, of Perth County. Other comments? Not seeing any hands go up. Just a quick comment for me again. So on Fridays, I have meetings with several MPPs and MPs, teleconference calls. And when I first brought this up as to what we were doing, Lisa Thompson, who was on the recovery team for the province of Ontario, and she's cabinet minister, 
you're well aware. Couldn't wait to get her hands on that data. And so I asked Meredith to forward that on to the four wardens and the numerous, I think there's 12 people involved, Meredith, in that, if I'm correct. Anyway, they want to see that data. They have seen that data and they are using that data in some of their approaches to moving forward in the recovery plan for Ontario. And we have got them the updated data and we'll be discussing that tomorrow at one o'clock. But no, they, they can't wait to get their hands on that data. Other than the fact they don't like some of the results. Anyway, I have a motion. The First County Council receives the economic development and tourism response to COVID-19 pandemic report for information. Moved by Rhonda, second by Daryl. Those in favor? Carried. Thank you. Well, we'll move on to the economic development activity report, Meredith. Thank you, Warden. Um, so again, I wanted, so I'm, as you all aware, um, are aware, this is probably going to be my last county council meeting until uh, September of 2021. So I did want to provide a fulsome report to, to you all in case I didn't get to see you uh, before I exited um, for my uh, maternity leave. Um, I do want to start off by thanking each and every one of you for all of your support over um, over the years, especially the new council members the last couple of years. So I do really appreciate all your support. Um, I'm really proud of the work that we do in economic development and tourism, and I appreciate um, the fluid conversations that we are able to have, and I appreciate your guidance. So um, without further ado, I'll just get into kind of the highlights of our, of our um, uh, report for my update. So I just wanted to highlight that our tourism brochure uh, is here. We have 40,000 copies and we've done a pivot. So we're coming up with a, a love local staycation campaign. So um, Ashley's been with, busy working on that. Um, she's currently negotiating all of the advertising that we pay, already paid for um, to be bumped up to uh, for next year. So hopefully we'll we'll see some results from that being mindful that we're all in, in this at, at these uncertain times. So she's been she's been diligently working at finding creative ways that we can still promote tourism in Perth County, but with, uh, you know, being mindful of practicing social distancing, um, being respectful of our current climate, and as the government slowly opens back up the economy, how we can uh, ensure that our businesses are being successful and we can support them. So uh, there will more to come on our, our local staycation. Um, the Southern Ontario Marketing Alliance, we were able to complete uh, three of our four shows that we had committed to for 2020. Uh, SOMA will actually be providing the county a rebate, so we should be receiving a rebate check uh, from them in the next couple of weeks, which is, uh, um, it, it is a nice gesture on their part uh, to ensure that we continue on uh, working together. And we are still continuing on following up with our leads and following up with the businesses that are interested. We're actually uh, Sarah was uh, working on a follow-up from one of the businesses last week. So, um, interestingly enough, uh, we our workforce engagement and attraction project. So that's kind of a four-part project. That was the housing forum and teeny tiny summer that we were hosting. We, this was funded through the rural economic development um, fund. Our employer lunches, our youth events, and our job fairs. So the employer lunches, youth events, and the teeny tiny summit are currently on hold until regular business resumes. Uh, I'm, I'm, they're aiming for the fall of 2020, but my guess is the spring of 2021. We are moving forward with job fairs though. Sarah has a job fair, a virtual job fair that she'll be participating in and she's uh, um, hopefully gonna have some of our business community who is currently hiring participate in that. That's on May 12th and uh, it's a virtual job fair. So she's gonna be continuing with those as uh, we've seen an uptake in our Opportunity Lives Here website and job postings. I think this morning alone, I've seen six job postings come up from local employers looking to hire. So um, uh, we're going to uh, focus our resources on that. Um, and that is that is uh, part of our Rural Economic Development Funding Program, the uh, Workforce Engagement Attraction Project. Uh, the Experiential Tourism Project was a big one for our, um, for our tourism portfolio this summer is uh, currently on hold. Ashley's been trying to work out uh, a digital program. I just don't, uh, uh, with our uh, facilitator, we're just not sure it's not going to um, 
going to fly. So this might be, have to be on hold and carried over to 2021. Unfortunately, we do have uh, our employers that are really itching to participate in it. It's just uh, while practicing social distancing and, and going digital, it's very difficult to, to work uh, out those experiences because it is all about experiences, but it's about touch, feel, um, uh, taste. So uh, we're hopefully more to come on that, um, but uh, I'm not too sure. Another highlight that we did this year so far was our um, part of our workforce development projects. We uh, supported the Avon Maitland District School Board, the technical training group, as well uh, with Invest Stratford uh, here on county and sponsored the mobile learning lab that the Avon Maitland School Board and technical training group are launching. And this is to encourage skilled trades. Um, it is a trailer that can be is uh, can be taken from school to school, organization to organization, and it's promoting skilled trades, welding and welding being the main um, trade, but everything from sewing um, to uh, uh, mechanics, uh, uh, STEM uh, projects. So hopefully the the trailer has been purchased, the equipment has been purchased. Currently working on decals, and then when business resumes as normal, hopefully we'll start seeing that again. Um, uh, we've taken on a really active role in our government advocacy for rural Ontario uh, amid this COVID-19 virus uh, pandemic. So we've been in constant contact, as, as the warden mentioned, with uh, with his Friday group, with the Western Ontario Wardens Caucus. I now currently sit on the steering committee and the support committee for the Western Ontario Wardens Caucus. And uh, we're in uh, I would I almost want to say daily talks with with the province and the federal government uh, when it comes to uh, our data from our surveys, as well as uh, hearing what our businesses are saying. We've been uh, making sure that our lines of communication have been open uh, for our business community to call us, email us, message us on social media. So we're hearing uh, a lot of different scenarios. Uh, our business community are not looking for loans or looking for grants they're looking for support and marketing so uh just trying to keep keep that um in the forefront um uh, as you all are aware i did resign this week from my uh, board of directors seat on the four county Labor market planning board um another project that we've been working on and we're going to be launching is uh we're doing a virtual launch of the farm gate uh signage program for the municipality of Perth south so that's going to be launched on May 25th. We've been promoting the Fanshawe College project and just continuing on with trying to keep our business directory up to date, keep our website up to date, keep the lines of communication on, open and continuing to have our uh, have some business continuity, even though it's uncertain times for our business community and for us at the um, in economic development and tourism. So trying to do everything we can to support um, support our businesses while staying within uh, the realm of our work plan and our mandate. Um, and I think that's uh, it for my report, if there's any questions. Questions for Meredith. Daryl, no, I got a thumbs up from Daryl. Thanks, Daryl. Two thumbs up now. Uh, <laughs> actually, thanks, Meredith. Um, I do want to thank you for your indulging me over the last month i know you and i discussed things on a daily basis it seems over economic development and some of the things going on i have with these calls on friday uh one of the things that some of you are aware of i was really pushing the last three weeks for some sort of support for the agri-food sector which is predominantly perth county and they did announce some money finally on wednesday so I forwarded an article on to Meredith and John Nader, and then John Nader and I had lengthy, no, that was Tuesday. Because yesterday, John Nader and I had several conversations with regards to it. So just so the people that are on council and your lower tiers know, they announced $252 million for the agri-food sector. And of that, there was only $125, $127 million of actually new money. 125 is money they're re-announcing that they forgot to do anything with with the agri-food sector that was previously announced a year ago so really it's kind of a drop in the bucket for a starter but we're still working on it and meredith and i have had some discussion with regards to maybe having a round table or something with 
uh, Randy Pettapis, who's the Deputy Minister of Agriculture, and Ernie Hardiman, who is the Minister of Agriculture, and get all the people involved and having a, just a round table and see if we can't push them for a little more. You know, I know 252 million sounds like a lot of money, but it is honestly like spitting into a wildfire thinking you're going to put it out, the problems that are in the agricultural sector right now. And it's more right now in the pork and the beef industry, but as you see the summer progress, it is going to go through all the sectors. And it is not going to be pretty at the end of the year. I know people right now that are not filling barns, and I know people right now that are just selling their beef cattle, their beef cows, and saying we're done because they've had enough. So if you think you're going to have uh, agri foods or uh, food stability and security going forward, you might be mistaken. Anyway, uh, and I thank you for all your hard work, Meredith. Thank you. Can I introduce Maggie before I sign off? That was going to be my next comment. Yeah, and I need, before you do that, I need a motion that Perth County receives the Economic Development and Tourism Update, update May 2020 report for information. Bob Wilhelm, Doug Ike. Those in favor? That's carried. Now you can introduce our new person who I've just actually seen this morning for the first time. <laughs> So, um, as you all know, uh, Maggie, as some of you all, I, uh, some of you may be aware of that on March 23rd, Maggie Martin um, joined our economic development and tourism team as our transit project coordinator. Maggie has been working diligently to get contracts in place with our service provider, develop and refine the routes, uh, address where uh, potential bus stops could go. So Maggie is a local girl. She was born and raised in Listowel, Ontario. Uh, she studied at the University of Guelph. She spent the last few years working in Ottawa, um, but she's happy and we are so happy to have her home and uh, working on our team. So I'm gonna pass it off to you, uh, Maggie, so you can update County Council on what you've been working on and where you're at with the transportation project. Thanks, Maggie. Awesome. Thanks for the introduction, Meredith. Um, as Meredith said, I'm so excited to be back and the hometown and be working on this great initiative. So I just want to take a few minutes to provide a brief update on the transportation project um, and kind of our roadmap um, for the project. I believe Charles, who is a transportation consultant, had provided the latest update, but the team has actually made the decision to put his resources on hold, um, which will allow us to uh, leverage his resources closer <coughs> to launch if needed. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, so the RFP evaluation team has identified Voyago as the preferred vendor for both the Perth County and the city of Stratford contact, contracts. So we've been working very closely with Voyago uh, to reach an agreement and finalize the key details of our service, which we hope to have complete within the next few weeks. Uh, once the service agreement is finalized, it will be appended to the L LPA for complete fi finalization. Uh, so although our initial start date was targeted for July 2nd, we plan to pass both of these agreements with flexible start dates due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So in terms of COVID impacts, uh, Voyago has a number of contracts that were scheduled to launch early this spring that have indefinitely been postponed. Uh, so this includes three services that were to launch April 1st, uh, one in June, and then two that were due to, due to launch in July, which includes ours. Uh, so Voyago has expressed concerns regarding delays in the bus manufacturing and the difficulties of hiring staff during these times. So it is probable that this will have a domino effect on our service, uh, delaying it beyond our initial target date. Uh, however, during this time of uncertainty, we are working diligently to have our project ready for launch as soon as it's safe to do so. So we have developed and finalized two Perth County routes, uh, which have been driven and confirmed by Voyago. Uh, once the service is up and running for a minimum of six months, we will take a look at our data that's collected from both Voyago and ongoing surveys and make any changes should the data suggest changes are required. So the service will be made up of uh, 12 two-passenger vehicles um, that will operate for approximately eight hours a day and six hours a week, which will exclude Sundays. So each of the two routes will have four runs per day and will operate in alternate directions in order to, pro to provide a round trip in as minimal time possible. So for example, the bus will make a counterclockwise trip and then will be immediately followed by a clockwise return trip on the same route. 
So the routes have been closely analyzed in order to determine uh, the most ideal stop locations for future riders. So these suggested stops have been closely considered to ensure that the locations are convenient, uh, safe, and accessible for all riders um, as per the ODOA standards. In order to ensure the safety of our potential riders and minimize potential traffic uh, disruptions, we have chosen to avoid roadside stops uh, wherever possible. As a result of this, many community buildings, such as public libraries and community centers, will be leveraged as stops. So Route A will commence in, commence in Stratford, and it'll travel in a loop uh, to Gads Hill, Bruner, Milverton, Newton, Millbank, Listowel, Atwood, and Mitchell, and then return in Stratford. The trip will take appro approximately two hours to complete, and it'll be immediately followed by a run in the opposite direction, as earlier stated. A number of proposed routes on, on or sorry, stops on Route A will include Knollcrest Noel Lodge, Anna Mays Bakery, Listowel Public Library, and Moncton, Atwood, and Mitchell Community Centers. Perth Route B will commence in Stratford as well, and it will travel to St. Paul's, St. Mary's, Kirkton, Mitchell, and Sebringville. Stops on this route will include Stratford General Hospital, St. Mary's Memorial Hospital, uh, Via Rail in St. Mary's, uh, Hillside Manor Long-Term Care Facility, uh, and St. Paul's, Mitchell, and Sebring Community Centers. Uh, so it's critical that we align our service uh, with existing service schedules. So we're currently leveraging the expertise of Voyago uh, to ensure a cohesive flow of timelines before finalizing any scheduling. So as of right now, we have our routes projected to commence at 6.30 a.m. in order to get riders to their place of employment before 8.30. So during this time, we're also eagerly moving forward with developing a marketing plan. And we're currently working with our graphic designer to create a brand and compose a logo for this transportation system. Uh, we're hoping to continue our close alliance with the inner city transit system, which is being run by Stratford, uh, in order to create a unified and simplified brand across both systems. We're also working on acquiring a booking system and, and determining the most effective ways for revenue and fare collection. Uh, all of these marketing and key project components will be consulted with Voyago in order to ensure that we're delivering the most efficient and desirable uh, service as possible. That concludes my um, transportation update, and I welcome any questions that you may have. Questions? Bob Wilhelm. There. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Is the plan to uh, bring the buses in every day or are they going to be stationed in Stratford uh, to reduce the mileage and, and time on the buses? I believe the plan is to have them stationed in Stratford. Um, that is something we can definitely um, consult with Boyago about. Um, but because they're both, uh, both um, routes are commencing in Stratford, I believe that's where they will be staying. Meredith, I'm not sure if you have anything to add to that. That's my understanding. Now, again, the contract with Stratford um, and Perth County isn't finalized yet with Voyago. They've had Stratford um, and St. Mary's, their routes have been have had some issues, so they've been still making modifications. But it is my understanding during the preliminary conversations with Voyago is that the buses would be stationed here um, uh, in Stratford. Other questions? It's looking too easy. I gotta have one then. Uh, this project was originally had a start and finish date. Has the province said anything with regards to extending the finish date, or are we still in line to have the original finish date? And the reason I ask that question is we all know for sure that the buses aren't going to be as busy now as they would have been two months ago. So I think your revenue stream is going to be very limited. So my concern is that the extension, if the end date is extended, we stand to lose considerable dollars, but if it stays the same, I'm thinking we'll be in far better shape. Any discussions on that anywhere? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, as far as we know right now, MTO has been very <laughs> bogged down, not, not very responsive to us right now, unfortunately. Um, but we do believe that we are having the same end date. So it'll be two years 
um, from when we launch is when we'll have the funding, I believe, Meredith. And we've modified our fares, uh, so they're not going to shorten our, um, they're not going to lessen the amount of money they give us. We're getting the same amount of money, but we've definitely modified our fares, um, our projected fares based on uh, the current situation. So we've been very modest in what we think we can collect on fares to ensure that one, we're using maximizing the grant money and two, that we're not overextending ourselves and setting ourselves up for failure. And that was Maggie, I did not do that. That was all her. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Still not seeing any. So I've got a motion here. Got to turn the page. First County Council receives a community transportation project update report for information. Moved by Doug Callum, seconded by Walter McKenzie. Those in favor? Carry. Thank you, Maggie, and welcome aboard. Okay, we're going to move on to Finance Division Activity Report. Or POA next? Oh, yes. I'm missing that on here. Yeah, we're going to move on to POA. Linda. Sorry. Good morning, Gordon. Good morning, councillors. Um, bring you a POA operations report. This has been completely unprecedented times for court services as for everyone else. So things have happened since I wrote the report. Um, our courts had been closed up to and including May 29th and that was ended this week to July 6th and they said at the earliest. Um, we've adjourned now 607 cases on by the authority of the Regional Senior Justice of the Peace. Um, staff have been in the office. We hear from people daily. They're very happy that staff are there to answer their questions, to put their concerns to rest. We have um, also been accepting charges for filing, um, taking payments by telephone, and the people who call in, I have to tell you, are very grateful that we're there. They're, we hear thank you for working quite often. Um, that reflects well on the county, it reflects well on the office. Um, we continue to accept some charges for filing. We continue to take payments. Pay tickets is still operational. Our revenues are down, our charges filed are down. However, with the way my computer systems work, I won't have um, reconciled numbers for you until the May 21st report, but I will bring you a comparison of this April compared to the other April so you can get an idea of what's going on. I do have a correction for the fines collected in first quarter, and it's a good news correction. So um, it came to my attention that some all the revenue wasn't in the system that I used to calculate these numbers for your reports. So the actual first quarter fines collected for 2020 is 349, 320, an increase of about 24,000. So in about half an hour, I have another teleconference with the provincial ministries. We meet every two weeks with Ontario Court of Justice um, and the Minister of Attorney General. So I'm looking for more updates, more guidelines. We have repeatedly asked that Bill 177 measures be put into place. Those measures allow for, um, they broaden the allowances for remote appearances. So the fewer people that actually physically need to come into this building, the better. But uh, those requests have not been, uh, we haven't had a positive response to them yet. The province is still thinking about that. So I will be back again on the May 21st meeting with lots more information for you, I'm sure, and happy to answer any questions. Questions for Linda? Don't see any. Mm -hmm. I have a motion that Perth County Council receives the POA activity report 
for information. Moved by Daryl, second by you. Those in favor? That's carried. Perfect. Uh, and thank you, Linda. Thank you. Uh, you have to go to work because I know it's probably been a struggle. I'm Ooh. surprised people are happy paying a fine. <laughs> and thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank anyway, you very much. Uh, moving on, Corey Bridges, manager of uh, finance and treasure. He has a report. Thanks, Warren Aitchison and members of council. Um, this is the activity report for the finance division. Um, what we're going to get into this week actually is our 2019 year end. Um, we will we'll be looking at a kind of a way of doing it uh, with them off site. Um, so we'll be providing electronic files for them. Uh, and it says, is there any invoices, et cetera, we'll be scanning them and sending it off to them on a portal that uh, BDO has set up for us. Um, also, along with that, uh, um, finance has been look, working with CIBC about an investment strategy uh, relation to uh, getting some money, a uh, greater return. Uh, we've seen in March that our, our daily deposits have dropped from 2.4% to 0.9% interest. Um, so we're looking at a strategy of uh, trying to get some bigger growth on the overall uh, uh, cash that uh, 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 Perth County has. Um, and then also looking at policy development. Uh, all these policies that you, you see in the report uh, is definitely trying to uh, work on the, the fiscal management strategy for Perth County itself. Uh, so those are policies are being worked on to come back to county uh, later this year. Uh, so if there's any questions with respect to this report, I'd be happy to answer them. Questions for Corey? Not see any hands move. Okay, I have a motion. Perth County receives the Finance Division Activity Report. Moved by uh, Bob Wilhelm, second by Doug Eitz. I see your hand up, Doug. Yeah, okay. Those in favor? Gary, thank you. And we'll move on to the next portion, and I believe that is Corey again. Thanks, Warden. Uh, this next report is a regulatory report, uh, uh, Regulation 284.09, and essentially it's the impact reports uh, of not including amortization within the overall approved budget. Um, what this report allows us to do, though, is when we do our financial year end now, um, it allows that our budget column within the financial uh, statements is more comparable to uh, how the operations show at the end at the end of the year uh if there's any other questions i'd be happy to answer them questions for corey i don't see any again so i need a motion that or i have a motion that perth county council receives the old regulation 284 09 impact report for 2020 report and the Perth County Council approves the report for expenses excluded from the 2020 budget as a requirement of Ontario Regulation 284-09 passed under the Municipal Act 2001. Moved by Todd, second by you. Any questions? Those in favor? That's carried. And just before we go on, Corey, I had a question with back to your first report and I forgot. So you're getting the work done by BDO right now, then you have to do your filing with the province of Ontario. And I got a brain cramp as to the name of that report. Have they extended that deadline? Uh, you're indicating the financial information return? Yes. Nothing has, nothing has come out saying um, that the day has been delayed. So it is the end of May for filing that report. Because I kind of know that I deal with BDO Dunwoody and one set of taxes and it's kind of like snail mail when you can't get things done in person and it's, I can't imagine you're going to have that ready by the end of then, but surprise me. Just ask them. Okay, moving on. We have Corey again. Yes. Uh, thanks, Warden. The third report here is the uh, request from SWIFT with respect to a loan guarantee. Um, 
what occurs is that they've already gone through phase two of the project and now we're looking at phase three of the project um, and what is they're being looked at is that uh, what happens is that they have a little bit of a uh, delay in when they actually get the money from the province and the federal government uh, uh, for when they spend the money um, so if you look at the second page of the report it's indicating that the 11 municipalities um, uh, are essentially proportionally providing a loan guarantee on in their respective areas. Uh, so, for example, uh, Perth County is about uh, receiving about 3.68% of the funding. Uh, so out of the $27 million that they're looking for, uh, uh, kind of a temporary borrowing um, loan, it, we're guaranteeing about just over a million dollars. Um, you have to look at it also is that we only invested like 570,000 and what's indicating is that we're, we're looking at about $5.5 million in capital infrastructure to be put into Perth County itself. Um, so if there's any questions with respect to the report, I'll be happy to answer them. Questions? Bob Wilhelm. Corey, when uh, I, I realize we're supposed to receive, uh, Perth County is supposed to receive $5.5 .5 million approximately in in work, uh, when would Perth County see this uh, actual work being done to improve fiber? I don't know the specific dates with respect to the actual uh, timelines of when this work will be done in the specific municipalities. Uh, but that is essentially what we're getting to is, is the phase three of the project. What I could do is uh, follow up with SWIFT itself, um, unless anybody else on the line has any more information regarding the project. I was going to ask Todd, maybe you can provide some update. Yeah, sure. Um, so phase three of the project uh, has been uh, at least partially announced uh, by the province. Um, there has been some... Um, care around the, the nature of that announcement, but uh, uh, certainly an informed person can uh, see that RFPs have been a, a released by SWIFT for all of the remaining projects uh, that were in the cohort uh, for uh, the, the area covered by the Western Wardens Caucus and some of the um, uh, adjacent members that have uh, signed up on the SWIFT project. Um, as I understand things, uh, the Perth County RFP has been released. It, uh, I believe, has a date somewhere, uh, like a return date for proposals from ISPs somewhere in December of uh, this year, if I remember right. This, of course, is uh, subject to uh, the changes that may come as a consequence of the COVID pandemic period and uh, delays that, that could come from um, available respondents. Uh, who may seek more time but there's a an ample lead time for the uh, response to the proposals or for the request for proposals and um, we believe that those will be adjudicated in the early part of 2021. Thanks Todd. Further questions? I see Rhonda's hand move I think. Rhonda. Well, I, have some, I have some concerns here that we are going to guarantee a loan. Everybody must remember that if something happens we're on the hook for a million dollars. It's just like anybody else guaranteeing a loan here. So I do have some concerns of what's going on uh, with the way the times are right now. Is the government even gonna have some money to give to us? I sure hope so. But uh, I do have some concerns. We're gonna guarantee a million dollars. And I don't wanna hear in two years that we're gonna have to come up with that. Other comments or questions, I don't. I'm not seeing any. Oh, Todd. Um, just to Councillor Eggett's comments, um, certainly uh, the province would not have invested in phase three if they weren't satisfied with the performance of the SWIFT organization for phase two, uh, even though we're still, believe it or not, in early phases of uh, construction there. Um, the um, So in, in the context of the reliability of this project and uh, my experience certainly serving on the SWIFT board, um, I can assure that uh, um, you know if anyone's going to get this done, it's SWIFT. Um, they have uh, already demonstrated their, their capabilities to the province. The province has uh, reacted by significant investment in phase three and, um, and in fact um, you know there's certainly uh, increasing evidence 
that the COVID period has indicated that one of the great infrastructure weaknesses in Canada right now is um, broadband internet in, in rural areas. So there's uh, fairly uh, several fairly significant signals from both the federal government and the province that uh, in fact, if anything, they intend to bolster their investment in broadband and, and hurry up the process given uh, the experiences uh, that we've learned uh, through the COVID period. Other questions, Walter? Yeah, I, I guess a uh, comment that I'll make is uh, this was a bit of a tough sell at one point in time uh, to the province. And uh, remember, I believe it was last year, um, the uh, uh, Southwestern Wardens all met in Woodstock with a meeting with Ernie Hardema to basically um, try and persuade him and show that this was something that we needed support on. And it boils down uh, similar to what Todd maybe just said that, uh, you know, if you think there's a real need for this and you want it, then you have to show some type of support for the province to come on side and support it as well. Further comments? I see head nods. And I have one or two quick comments. You know me. So I did attend the voters portion of the SWIFT annual meeting. Lori and I, by teleconference, they actually shut the video off for that. Uh, nobody shaved or combed their hair. Um, the one thing I found interesting, Lambton County, correct me if I'm wrong, Todd, Lambton County is done for the most part. Lambton County, and I think, is it Elgin County? And they were working in Wellington. But if I recall correctly, they said in Lambton County, they only passed about 20% of the households. Is that? Yes. Yeah, so so uh, to the warden, uh, in terms of uh, commentary, um, SWIFT's uh, projects in phase two uh, included three uh, counties, uh, Wellington, Norfolk, and Lambton. And um, it, it, those uh, three projects, uh, when they were let out to uh, ISPs to propose how to achieve the outcomes, um, uh, there were, I believe, 11 or 12 contracts issued across the three counties uh, that were involved in that pilot, and they actually exceeded the metrics, uh, the expected metrics in terms of kilometers passed of fiber and premises served. Um, so there was uh, more investment uh, than expected that comes from the ISPs. And remember that part of the SWIFT project uh, process is to uh, not only leverage uh, municipal money, which has been given already by uh, all of the participants of SWIFT, as you've heard from uh, Mr. Bridges, but also to um, leverage ISP investments into the system because they're essentially being stimulated by the other monies that are put on the table. So um, the, the earliest indicators, as I said, from the three counties that are in the pilot uh, or phase two, as, as we prefer to call it, um, have been uh, very positive in terms of uh, achieving more than, than what was expected. Um, however, to your questions, um, no, I don't think there has been uh, a completion in any of the counties or any of the 11 contracts that um, have been issued at this point. Uh, it's still a work in progress and, and will continue um, through 2020 and even into early 2021 for those projects because laying that amount of fiber is pretty uh, significant work. And um, uh, your, uh, you asked a second point, which is about the total impact. And the challenge is that um, Southwestern Ontario has approximately $3 billion uh, investment requirement to bring fiber to every premise. Uh, so the, the, the challenge that we face is that, um, you know, between federal and provincial contributions, we're talking about 200, 250 million at this point uh, in the SWIFT area. And, um, and that's a, a significant deficit versus the three billion that is actually required to get the job done and get 100% coverage. So um, SWIFT, Swift is, is, has always been um, intending to try to close the gap in rural broadband uh, from, uh, that, that currently exists, but it's also clearly acknowledged that at the best, we will only get 20 to 30% coverage uh, of rural areas and there will still be that gap between the 250 million dollar investment and the three billion that's actually required. Thanks Todd. Uh, on a brighter note, there has been an announcement by the federal government as to more money for rural broadband. 
but I honestly haven't seen a figure. I may find out more details tomorrow, uh, but I wouldn't count on it until you actually see it, if it's like the agri sector. Anyway, uh, moving on. So I do have a motion here that the CAO be authorized to sign the letter of intent indicating that Perth County would be prepared to provide a guarantee of $1.013 million to facilitate SWIFT obtaining a credit facility from the selected financial institution. Do I have a mover? Todd, do I have a second? That would be you, McDermott. Any more questions? Those in favor? Those in favor? One, two, keep your hands up. Carried. We're carried. Thank you. So that concludes uh, Corey. She has archives now. And next we have archives, and I see Betty Jo up there. Good morning. Thank you, Warden. Hello, everyone. Uh, the report that you have is uh, an update on collections management reference and public outreach work that's been going on uh, and is underway at the Stratford Firth Archives. So providing good care for the counties and the community's assets uh, at the archives and excellent customer service remain our top priorities. Since the reading room was closed to the public, uh, archive staff continue to respond to requests for information, copies of photographs, that sort of thing, uh, through phone calls and email. Uh, like other county staff, we have begun uh, planning for transitioning back to having the archives open to the public in a way that's safe for visitors and staff when that time comes. And uh, thank you all for your time this morning. That's my report. If there are any questions, I'll certainly do my best to provide you some answers. Questions for Betty Jo, Bob Wilhelm. Betty Jo, concerned with uh, your water issue, uh, have you uh, sourced uh, what the cause was of the leak and, and uh, have the repairs been uh, take, uh, done yet? Well, it's an ongoing concern, and, and that's a great question because we've never actually uh, determined what the cause was. It wasn't a leak as such because there's nothing, since it didn't come from the roof, we know that, um, but there's there's no water moving through the pipes over top of the record storage area at all. Um, so condensation was identified as the likely culprit, and so certainly facility staff were, were great, came, came right in, uh, brought in uh, some outside experts to see what might have caused the problem, um, made some educated guesses, uh, serviced the, the humidifiers, and we haven't had a problem since then. So the solution has been just diligence on the part of staff, and we've kept uh, plastic sheeting in place where, where we had the problem as well. Uh, e even though uh, it hasn't reoccurred, and we're just checking on that. Um, so as I said, diligence is really the solution in this case, and we haven't been able to determine exactly what caused the condensation in the first place. Other questions? <clears throat> Bob? Uh, so have the humidifiers not been uh, regular maintenance, and, and that maybe caused the issue, or is that whole uh, system regularly maintained by the professionals? It is regularly maintained. Um, the challenge with archive storage that I, I think um, may have contributed to this, uh, rather than a lack of maintenance, is just, just a challenge for any system. Uh, the contrast between the relatively high, we like our humidity in our collection room to be about 50%, um, and that's industry standard for preservation reasons. Uh, the contrast between that and average humidity outside of a building um, in December, January in Perth County uh, can can challenge just managing moisture levels in, in humidification systems. And um, I wish that uh, Nick were on the line. I suspect he could give you a much better answer than I'm than I'm stumbling through here. But uh, really, it just comes down to um, the systems are are working well. Uh, until until they don't, and so we have to be diligent about um, uh, responding to to those times when when they are challenged by what we're trying to achieve uh, in comparison to what the environment is providing outside. 
Further questions? Perhaps John McClellan might be able to answer that question, Bob, when we get when he comes yeah. on the line, because I know John and I have had some discussions about what's going on out there too. So we'll okay. maybe refer that to John for further update later on. Yeah, that's good report. Thanks, uh, Betty Joe. Uh, so I have a motion here that the Perth County Council receives a Q1 activities report for Stratford Perth Archives 2020, moved by Doug Kellum, second by Todd Kazenberg. Those in favor? It's carried. Thank you. Moving on. Technology services. And we have Steve Drake in the house. Somebody had to get us going. Yeah. Thanks, Warden, and uh, members of the council. Uh, so this reports an overview of the projects and activities technology services staff have been working on recently. For IT staff, the majority of work has been focused on a few key areas. Uh, we're working to refine the online meeting process for council and staff. And as Sally alluded to earlier, we're working to review options for online public meetings. Uh, we're also setting up staff to work from home. So where possible, we continue to set up staff with the resources and training to work from home instead of coming into the county buildings. Uh, and then dealing with support requests. We have seen an increase in help desk type issues, mainly related to staff working from home for the first time and getting used to the technology and the new way of doing things. For GIS staff, they've been busy working on operational requests, including report photos for staff reports and data requests for both upper and lower tier staff. They've also been working, uh, work also continues on larger projects uh, for the new official plan, 911 sign replacements, and the winter maintenance modernization project. Uh, that's my report. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Questions for Steve? Not seeing any. I have a motion that Perth County Council receives the Technology Services Division Activity Report for information. Moved by Rhonda, second by Bob Wilhelm. Those in favor? Carried. Perfect. Thanks, Steve. And now we'll move on to the Tree Inspector Report. So the Tree Inspector Report is um, a housekeeping item. It comes to you every month for information purposes. And if you have any questions, I certainly will follow up with Marvin Smith. Questions? I'm not seeing any, but I actually got a question for Lori, and this is a comment you and I have talked about before <laughs> with regards to tree inspections. Right. So this does cost the county a certain amount of money. And you know me, I like cost recovery. Uh, would anybody here on council have an objection to us looking into cost recovery on inspections instead of just banging this on the general levy it would actually be more applicable to those who are benefiting benefiting from tree removal from their bushes. Do I have any comments from the people on the screen? Bob? I agree that uh, this should be looked at uh, on our fees and, and uh, as far as cost recovery. If we're going to try and move to that model more, we need to look at everything. And, and this is one area we could certainly look at. Walter. Well, I guess, yeah, I, I, I think it's probably a, a good approach to take. Um, the only thing I would add maybe is that uh, we um, contact maybe our neighboring counties and see uh, how that uh, tree inspection in their in their municipalities are are financed. Lori. So through the warden, uh, thank you, Council, for your comments on that. Uh, we are underway with a full program uh, review mm -hmm. for the forestry bylaw. One aspect uh, would be checking um, the program with our uh, neighbors and how it performs outside of Perth County, um, which would include a fee review. So I will have a list of who charges what and what those services are and uh, whether or not uh, we could move to cost recovery. We can provide that information to council and then you can provide the direction as you see fit. We'd be happy to follow up with that. 
Everybody got everybody in favor of that? Mm -hmm. Looks like it. Then we'll have that proceed. Yes, it's underway. We don't need a motion or anything for that. It's I just underway. wanted to bring that up. We had tree inspection report on yes. the docket. Right. And actually, once you go south and west of here, there is no such thing as tree reports because they don't really have any bylaws in place. They've been trying to get them in place right. to some municipalities, but to no avail. It's right. basically in our immediate area where that is more prevalent. Right. So just the motion. So I have a motion here that Perth County Council receives the March 2020 three inspectors report for information moved by that would be matt second by walter those in favor that's carried thank you okay paramedic services i've seen donald on there sorry we're a little slow getting to you i'm sure you're busy but you're up there he is all uh, all good uh, good morning mr warden and uh, county council um, I'll uh, be brief, uh, but uh, I just want to give you an update on, on what we're uh, doing in, in paramedic services. Uh, certainly, uh, our COVID response uh, continues to be our main focus uh, on a bunch of different areas. Um, but uh, I am happy to report that uh, we're seeing a little bit of um, relief in our operations from a call response perspective. Uh, we've seen a uh, about a 5% decrease uh, compared to our February 2020 uh, response time, uh, res response uh, numbers, uh, uh, and we're maintaining a, a, a decent, uh, effective response time to the calls we are uh, receiving. Um, and then, uh, since the pandemic has uh, hit us uh, and it was declared, we've seen about a 23 to 27 percent uh, decrease uh, per week uh, in our call volume. So it, it's kind of, um, you know, we're, we're living a bit of a new norm uh, in the, the pre-hospital world. Um, and you know, the, the, the calls we are receiving for demand for response, um, our patients are, are higher acuity. They are they are sicker. Um, so you know we, we are receiving what we're deeming as true medical emergencies. Um, that to me does suggest that um, the community and the public are, are utilizing other healthcare resources for their low non-emergency medical needs. Um, so you know whether they're they're being able to access their primary care uh, physician or nurse practitioner or virtual care that's becoming a bit of a, a new initiative in in the healthcare industry. Um, so uh, either way, we we are sort of relieved that it gives some breathing room for our staff to um, be adjusting to the new norm when it comes to protection and responding to COVID-like symptoms in the community for for our calls. Um, and you know it's it's given our staff a little bit of uh, like I said breathing room to to um, you know live what we're living uh, now from a day-to-day -day perspective. So we are keeping a very close eye on that um, because you know uh, if we're starting to see trends or, or areas of concern that we, we need to work with our healthcare partners and uh, keep them informed as well as provide some new solutions if there's a requirement for it. Um, so our response times there we're maintaining a uh, a good response time within the industry norm. Um, you know, definitely less than nine minutes uh, overall for our, our emergency response times, um, and uh, we're, we're not seeing any drastic uh, in, uh, in increases. We're actually seeing some areas where we're decreasing in a, in a good way, and that's probably as a result of one, the, the call demand is, is down, and two, um, we're still seeing the uh, positive impacts of that uh, system enhancement that was approved last uh, summer, where we added some new resources to the system in July of 19. Um, in our clinical development area, um, you know, we've uh, uh, been really focused on the intake uh, orientation for our new hires. Um, so we're staggering our, our, our new recruits coming through the door for orientation and being prepared to be uh, what we're calling road ready um, to be able to work independently as a paramedic with uh, their partner. So that's been a big focus, uh, getting those folks trained and, and oriented to the county, uh, to our service, and then being prepared to, to work as uh, uh, full-fledged paramedics. Uh, the other area, um, as sort of an update to a um, email update that was provided to, to you folks uh, via the CAO on the new uh, program that we've been providing and uh, starting up uh, in helping the uh, COVID uh, swab testing in the community, mostly in the long-term care sector. Uh, and then uh, our uh, sort of initiatives to assist palliative care in the community. So um, uh, since that report uh, via email a few weeks ago, uh, we've selected uh, um, five paramedics uh, to uh, go through the recruiting, uh, the training process uh, on some of these new initiatives. And as of uh, Monday, 
um, sorry, Tuesday, uh, we began uh, testing in long-term care. So uh, we're helping uh, achieve the public health goals of expanding uh, COVID testing uh, throughout the community, especially in our vulnerable populations, such as the older adults um, uh, needing you know, long-term care needs in the, in the long-term care facilities. Um, so we're we're happy to you know and, and really um, proud to be uh, a valued stakeholder in in, hot, in the community as well as the healthcare system, and uh, you know it's a true testament to the value that the healthcare system have in our paramedics to be able to uh, fill that uh, system gap and need. Um, I already mentioned that we've uh, done some recruiting uh, for our uh, part-time paramedics. So um, to date, we have selected 25 new part-time paramedics. Um, we already began this process before we uh, went down the road of uh, having a pandemic declared upon us. So um, you know, it, it just helped us escalate the need to, to onboard these staff sooner than later so that we were uh, building our pandemic plan appropriately. And then obviously preparing for the future, um, you know, as you can imagine, our part, our full-time staff, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, are uh, not taking vacation currently, um, you know, because there's not a, really an opportunity to enjoy that well-deserved time off. Um, so at some point we'll see a surge in, in those vacation requests. So we do need to have that uh, operational readiness for our staff uh, on a level to, to backfill those uh, vacation requests. Um, we've also transitioned two of our uh, primary care paramedics to be acting commanders. Uh, we needed a uh, to improve our continuity in that division, um, you know, due to a uh, shuffle of uh, taking two full uh, two primary care paramedics and making them uh, full time commanders as a result of our uh, appointments of the deputy chiefs earlier in the year. So um, you know, we're, we're happy to have uh, those team members on board helping our operation and. Um, you know, a big focus of those roles is to support the paramedic staff uh, shift in, shift out, and they're doing a phenomenal job of, of doing so. And then uh, we began recruiting, um, you know, as per the org structure uh, that was approved, uh, we had a commander for performance and development that was um, uh, approved to have, and uh, we began the recruiting process uh, two weeks ago, and we began the interview process earlier this week, so uh, we're hoping to have a a candidate selected uh, in the, in, by early next week and begin that process to transition that uh, newly appointed uh, person. That was an internal and external job posting um, and we had uh, 12 candidates uh, apply and uh, we've been doing those interviews since uh, Monday of this week or Tuesday of this week, sorry. Uh, labor relations continue to you know work very closely with the union, especially through this pandemic. Um, you know, uh, we have a great working relationship with the with, with the QP local. Um, they're very supportive and very collaborative on a, on a lot of areas. So uh, we're really impressed with uh, how everyone's come together um, prior to the pandemic, but especially during the pandemic. You know, this is where you know we need to work very close together to to provide support and results uh, for our staff so that they can do their job effectively and safely um, day in day out. And then risk management, um, so we're really looking at, you know, the, the, the personal protective equipment is really a, a big focus that we're keeping an eye on. So we've had some great improved uh, deliveries in the last few weeks uh, where we have uh, sufficient uh, PPE to get us through several weeks, if not months. Um, but we're also beginning our stockpiling because, um, you know, if you, if you keep close eye on this this uh, virus, you know, they, they are preparing the healthcare community for a second wave of this later in the year, uh, in, in the winter of 2020. So uh, we need to prepare for uh, our response to that if we are to be hit with that second wave. So, um, you know, the team has been, you know, doing a great job of sourcing uh, PPE as well as other uh, critical pieces of equipment to, to maintain our response to this uh, during this pandemic phase and then preparing for phase two if it's to, to come down the pipe. i hand over to Mac and then uh, we'll, we'll open up questions for you folks if you have any. Not hearing them. No, I can't hear them. <laughs> hey, Mac, I think you're on mute on your phone. Well, actually, it shows green on, us on the screen. No. Can't no, hear still can't hear him. No.
he's showing green, but yeah. I had the same problem last week. Okay. Well, do that. Uh, I'll go back to you, Donald, because we can hear you. Uh, does anybody have questions for EMF? Daryl. Daryl. Great. Great. Thanks, Sarah Donald. Um, have you encouraged any of staff to take holidays? As much as I know it's tough, there's nothing enjoyable, but we are all in similar issues. Um, people everywhere are encouraging staff. I know hospitals in particular because they're so small. Uh, I don't know what stock they really are. Just, just curious on that. Yeah, no, that's a really great question, and uh, thank you for asking that. So that kind of ties into our mental health um, supports uh, that we're, we're providing during this time, and really the supports we provide all the time. Um, so. As much as staff aren't taking time off, you know, we do encourage that. Uh, obviously, we, we you know there's been there's been no issues with uh, approving any requests as, as they do come through. Um, you know, we are also encouraging, you know, um, you know that that personal life balance. Uh, we we have provided resources uh, and tools on how to be coping through through this time. Um, some some tips and tricks for for our staff to also help and assist their family and their children. You know. There's a lot of questions, there's a lot of concerns, um, and so, so we provided those resources. Um, in addition to that, you know, we, we do have our peer support team that uh, staff have access to 24-7. Um, those, are, those are trained personnel, uh, trained paramedics in our, in our operation that, that have the ability to, you know, help talk about conversations with us. Um, and other uh, is, um, uh, they have the ability to resources in the mental health realm. And then um, Medibi Health Services um, has um, onboarded a new service uh, for virtual cognitive behavioral therapy uh, sessions. And that, that support and resource has been extended to the Perth County Paramedic staff as well as being part of, you know, the, the Medibi family. Um, so, so we have uh, expanded our resource footprint in the, in, in the operation for those realms. But uh, to your question specifically, uh, yes, we encourage people to really you know, take that much-deserved time off, try and get that family balance um, because, you know, that demand uh, coming into work uh, has added some extra stress these days uh, with, you know, um, you know dealing and, and facing this virus head on uh, and then ways we can keep themselves they're then protected uh, both at work and at home yeah. any other questions actually I think we have Mac on the phone now no, he's oh he's gone he's any other <laughs> questions for Donald oh here he comes oh maybe Mac hey, how's, how's that there we go <laughs> technology <laughs> Uh, I really didn't have anything to add other than week six, which would have started April 28th to May 2nd. Our past week in terms of Yeah, he's coming Mac, hold the phone up closer. Okay. Uh, so week six, I'm just going to say, was our best week uh which was april 26th to may 2nd within 96 percent of our call volume last year so that's the first time we've reached that so maybe it's a trend we'll see what happens and that's all i have been. okay thanks mac uh just a couple comments so you and I have talked about PP, a bunch of stuff, either by phone or text, and uh, includes Donald. So we did get, I'm not sure if all the counts were aware, we did get a bunch of reusable respiratory masks from Medivy on the East Coast. And that was yes, great. We did. In uh, this part of the country, so it was split between Chatham, Elgin, and Perth County. We did get a 12, we got a lot of surgical masks from Bruce Power, which uh, Mac, uh, Mac had sent a letter of thank you as well as did I. So we've got that. So sort of that, the one thing that we seem to still be lacking is those N95 masks. And we aren't the only ones, because I know last Friday, Yard County was desperately searching for some for their one facility, Blue Water, 
where they had not only an outbreak of uh, COVID, but they also had an outbreak of chickenpox. And there does not seem to be any of those around to be found. Are we going to be able to stockpile some of those before we maybe get into a second round of uh, COVID-19, do you think? Or is this yep. going to be a battle going on? Well, there's always a battle for those. But I think there are now opportunities existing. We, we came across one in Medigan Research Unit. Basically, it is uh, re revolves around uh, if you purchase 15,000 over the next every month. So Medivis reviewing that now, and we think it'd be an opportunity for us. But with the reusables, we're okay anyway. We don't need the N95s, but it's the backup to the backup. If that makes sense. Getting a kick of a bit of feedback, but anyway, thank you very much. Another thing that uh, you might not be aware of is MetaV donated a large sum of money towards the COVID-19 response. And I sent Matt Crossman a letter thanking him for that as well, yeah. just so you're aware. But that was done as MetaV, the corporation, not just yeah. MetaV in Ontario. Yeah. So uh, again, thank you very much for that. And uh, any questions more for? Paramedic services? Don't see any. I have a motion that Perth County receives the paramedic services update report. Moved by Bob Wilhelm, second by Daryl Hurley. Those in favor? Gary. Thanks, Donald. Thanks, Mike. Moving on. Mm -hmm. Now we get into the real expenses. John McClellan, public works update. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Good morning, Council. Um, if I might uh, just be able to sort of circle back to the consent agen agenda there in 5.2, the Enbridge uh, Natural Gas Stratford Reinforcement Project. Um, I know Rhonda had made a comment there, and, and um, perhaps I can update Council a little further on that, if I may. Um, I do know what uh, the county, uh, myself, Ken Bettles at Perth South and West Kip for Perth East. We met uh, via teleconference uh, with, with Enbridge to sort of go over this project and get a few more details from them and, and certainly let them know some of our concerns here. So just a, a few uh, bits of information that I'd like council to be aware of. Uh, this project involves a 12 inch transmission pipe for the natural gas and that is going to be from the Perth Oxford boundary to the south end of Stratford. Uh, construction is expected to begin in two, 2021, and their preferred route is uh, Road 112, which is a boundary road between Perth South and Perth East up to Harmony, and then a county road uh, north of Harmony. Uh, they're going to then carry on uh, west on line 29 and then uh, up. Uh, north again on Perth Road 113. Uh, it should be noted that uh, residences and farms along this route will not be able to have a connection off of this type of natural gas infrastructure. Um, I guess, if you will, you liken it to kind of a 400 series highway where you just don't see, uh, you know, residential accesses or anything like that, uh, individual accesses off something like this. So, um, that's something just to be aware of. We certainly informed Enbridge of uh, our planned capital work in this area for this year. And um, as well, they've started a virtual open house, which began on Monday and runs until May 18th. At some point in time, just so council is aware, Enbridge will want the county to sign on to some agreements. So, um, once this uh, open house, virtual open house completes, I hope to have some more information. If council would like, I'd be happy to update them in a report later on. Um, if, any questions in regard to that? No, doesn't look like it. Thank you. Um, moving on then, to our uh, public works update report. 
Uh, just kind of interesting over the last few weeks, listening in on the emergency control group meetings, uh, certainly the OPP and Stratford Police Services uh, indicating, you know, a lot of higher speeds on our area roadways. And, and certainly we're seeing still an, an numerous accidents uh, on, on our roadways. Um, you know, this is uh, a little concerning to us, I guess, and and just sort of goes to show the importance of, of continuing to maintain minimum maintenance standards. And I'd just like to note that accidents occurring on municipal roads and highways provide the largest single source of claims against municipalities today. So certainly uh, we're, we're very focused, uh, our roads division on continuing to meet or exceed those minimum maintenance standards for the public safety of road users and to help mitigate the risk of civil liability to the county. So in this report, I've just kind of indicated the things we've been working on. Work really has not slowed up for the Public Works Department. If anything, I think we're a little busier than, than this time of year normally. Um, albeit we're, we're having to do things in a little different manner and, and that's not always easy for staff and, and for some of our operations. Uh, so I'd just like to commend them for, for you know, working through this and, uh, and still providing great service out there. Uh, with our roads division, I anticipate to very shortly that they're they are planning to do some of the capital road work on Perth Road 112 and 113, uh, which we'll get into in, in a report a little later on here. Uh, that's gonna involve some intersection realignment and some vertical grade work on Perth Road 112. So they're currently working at uh, organizing that, um, which we hope to begin before the end of the month. Uh, Fleet Division, uh, we, we still have uh, a a few trucks uh, with the plows mounted and things like that. Uh, hopefully we're not gonna see anything substantial out of the colder weather we expect uh, Friday and Saturday, but uh, um, of course, uh, we always have to be prepared, be prepared for those types of events. Um, so they've been busy getting all of our other equipment prepared and, and, and everything safety. Our facilities division has been very busy. Uh, we've We've accomplished a couple of capital projects already at the courthouse and new heat pumps at the Listowel Paramedic Services Base. Um, next week, we hope to do uh, installation work in the attic at the courthouse. And we've also had our Public Works Department to repair drainage issues at the archive site out front there. Uh, just maybe a, a follow-up to Councillor Wilhelm's uh, questions and or comments regarding archives and the moisture issues in there. Um, I know Nick, uh, as soon as the, anything was noted, we brought in the experts to come in and, and take a look at that system. And there really wasn't any, um, I, anything identified as a particular problem or issue with the system itself. Um, Nick said, you know, it might have been a, a perfect storm uh, where, as Betty Jo alluded to, the differences in, in uh, humidity of what they like to keep their, their records room at and, and what the outside humidity may be. So this system that we do have in the, this building is a little more complicated. Uh, uh, we do have, you know, co computer programming that, that does run it. Uh, what Nick has done is set up regular maintenance and it's scheduling to go over with the, with our contractor there for that. So um, as Betty Jo said, uh, due diligence on our part uh, will, will help uh, mitigate any future problems, but there was just nothing that we could really identify that, that would have caused this particular issue. And we haven't seen anything since. Um, to update council on another problem that we had uh, at the county courthouse la late last week, and that was a collapse of the sanitary pipe in between the courthouse and the Service Ontario building at Five Huron. Uh, we had to do an emergency evacu uh, excavation and repair on this Monday, and what we found was that there was a combination of both uh, ABS at the courthouse clay tile in the middle and cast iron at the uh, Service Ontario building. 
And the issue that we had was a collapse there of the clay tile section. So what we've done is uh, we dug down a trench right between the two buildings and we've totally replaced that sanitary with ABS. Um, we, we needed to shut down both facilities around starting around 10 a.m. on Monday. And uh, we, were, we had that work completed, the repair complete to the sanitary pipe by about 5.30 p.m. that day. So we, were, we had both buildings operational for Tuesday morning. And I just wanna uh, send a, a shout out to our facilities supervisor, Nick Larson, who just did a great job of coordinating the work in, in very short order. That uh, about concludes my, uh, my department update there, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that council may have. Questions, Bob? Thanks, John. I have a couple questions. <clears throat> I saw on Steve's report that uh, <clears throat> there was some uh, programming, et cetera, with the, for the tracking the plows. Um, is that uh, regular or is it uh, new programming? Because as you indicated earlier, it is important to uh, be able to defend yourself in court if necessary. And the second one was, the uh, question is that, uh, are you uh, able to, or is there anything going on as far as security in the walls in the courthouse as it was discussed before we uh, um, had our last council meeting or after our last council meeting at the courthouse? Certainly. So for your first question there regarding to uh, the AVL systems in our uh, plow trucks, um, I believe last year there we had a capital um, project there that were replaced uh, the AVL systems in, in all of our trucks and including our contractor trucks. Um, so that um, that system is is new to us. We've been up and running with that for, for just over a year now. Uh, we were testing it previously and uh, that seems to be functioning quite well for us. Um, with, with all of our sort of technology needs, certainly IT plays a huge role in, in supporting us and, and our equipment. So um, I, I apologize, I wasn't there at, uh, here to, to hear all of Steve's report, but uh, hopefully that answers your question with the AVL systems. Further questions? Bob? Um, yeah, I, the, uh, I guess my question would be to expand on that. Um, it, is that system, um, I guess, could the lower tiers hook into that system uh, with their own plow trucks? Uh, First South, we're very limited on, on our tracking uh, capabilities and it's something that uh, uh, I actually brought up at our last council meeting and, and uh, would the lower tiers be able to uh, hook into the county system and, and have it monitored and also um, on the uh, walls for security? And, and sir, sorry, the second part there, Bob was, yeah, the second part, uh, we had discussed uh, we were going to look at putting up walls to limit uh, access to throughout the courthouse uh, there a month or two ago, whenever we were last in the courthouse. And uh, I was just wondering how that was progressing. Right. Okay, so the first part there, the AVL, AVL system for member municipalities. Um, currently, the county and Perth East have the same AVL provider. Um, and that, uh, you know, I think that's open to, to any of municipality that wants to, to go on that. It's not necessarily uh, ne necessary that um, each, you know, anyone piggybacks the county or anything like that. Uh, it can run independently uh, for, for your own purposes. So it's a web, it's, it's a web service um, and you just log on and it tracks, uh, it tracks your plows. So um, I believe when we discuss things like this, like AVL, um, patrolling modules and, and, and things like, we, we all talk together and uh, we're all looking, I guess, at, at the same time of 
potentially being on the same platform. So um, a, a great example was yesterday, we were all on about sine retro reflectivity. And, and again, uh, you, using uh, some software and a platform that is common amongst us. So we're, we're always uh, looking to do that and, and share, and we'd be happy to, to assist in any way possible. Uh, for the second part of the question, the security and, and walls at the courthouse, um, I think that will be part of the, I know maybe a overall report when we get back to things that we're going to plan to do with the campus and, and the courthouse and what needs to get done this year. Certainly uh, the focus will be with the courthouse on security, uh, central admin and the elevator. So further to that, there is a report coming back in the 21st meeting, the two weeks from today, and that will just go through some of the areas talked about here and, and other areas. Yes, about the, the reopening, it's particularly more, POA. Yeah. And, the, and the one thing in particular is the reopening of POA. Yes, security and included. Security and social distancing factored in. <laughs> yes. And it could be an issue. Daryl, you got a question? Yeah, yeah, no, great there. Thanks. It's just I remember the direction that day was is to act rather sooner than later on the security. And I'm sure that's where uh, Mr. Wilhelm is heading with this as well. Are we locking doors or anything at the top end at least? Uh, maybe some signage to basically that you can only get in through the basement and only exit through the top. Well, the thing we've got done so far is we got all the doors locked. Yeah. Okay. We've got them open right soon. They they are working on it. Yeah. Uh, we should have a better handle by the next meeting. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's all I can really say at this point. Like I, I can see. Yeah. And Lori can speak to it if you if you like, Lori. Okay, so thank you through the warden. Um, great question. It is it is important in our mind as we're looking about the reopening. The POA draws the largest number of clientele that come into the building. So I can tell you uh, some of the things that we're working on as we look to how we're going to move people through the building with social distancing and the security in mind. Um, we will be bringing a report to you on the 21st um, um, that does reflect um, a one access into the building and uh, the centralized reception as John had indicated. So um, there's a number of staff working on some of that information we will be preparing a report. It'll be out to you uh, next week because we have to have the report out uh, by the end of next week for you to consider it on the 21st. So um, rest assured, we are looking at it and uh, security is a big aspect of what we need to address in this report, but it would be a single access point off the parking lot. Daryl? Yeah, okay, great there. Thanks, uh, Lori. Now, with the social distancing and far as putting protocol and that such together, I mean, the province is considering opening hardware stores and certain things now. Do we know, we really don't know how much information is going to come down and when and what we can or can't do. But that being said, I do see some budging and allowing a few more things to open. <laughs> Like as far as social distancing and such, I mean, that isn't going to last forever. I, I don't believe. Um, just how much time do we invest in this is where I'm going. When they are tweaking and talking daily of what to open, how many people let in, and we, we have to keep consistent and make sure we don't go off on a direction that's above and beyond the federal and more provincial envy. It's really tough. And, <laughs> There's a lot of pointing and fingers pointing at the federal level right now between two governments. One wants to budge and the other one has no intention of budging. So that really makes it hard for us as well and frustrating um, as you sit back and we try and let through this storm, if you would. So um, it's, it's difficult. I'll let Lori address. It. I'll be honest with you, Daryl, your internet must be bad because you were kind of cutting in and out on us. So through the warden, um, I think I understand what you're saying because it's changing every day. And uh, we get several um, reports uh, from the province almost daily 
that says, you know, we'll allow this, we'll allow that, but then there's there's not a whole lot of detail on what that actually looks like. So we are working best we can with, you know, the floor plan that we have and the ability to move people through the building. We will have to be ready um, if they say POA resumes, once that resumes, we have to be ready for that uh, particular service. So we will be bringing you, um, you know, we can be very creative and we'll have some options for you. So, but I am targeting the 21st. Um, we won't have, you know, all the details on, you know, this is um, exact costing or whatever for the elevator, but there will be a creative plan in there in terms of reopening the security in the building and where we move forward. Because I think we also need, you'll see there's a report later on here about the five Curran Street and uh, doing some work there. We, it, we do have a re, uh, referral recommendation on that because I know I have to come back to be able to talk about the accommodation in this building for a number of staff so you don't go and fix a building roof and then decide you want to put a second floor on it. So that information, um, we'll be looking at the accommodation information as well on the 21st. That's my target. So um, a lot of work has been done on that particular aspect, but you are absolutely correct. Every day it's something different from the province and the social distancing, I believe, will be in for all summer. So we have to make sure that we plan for that. And uh, that is what we're looking at. So. Further cost questions? Bob? I had hoped uh, when our last meeting was at the courthouse that uh, we would have the security of the walls, doors, et cetera, in place for when um, we were going to open this back up not just the report and i'm quite disappointed that we're not going to have the security walls and, and containments in place for when this opens up uh, thank you through the warden so um i can't just put them up because there's a cost item to that and and, and there's a number of changes that we would need to make to make that happen and so i need council's authorization to, to proceed with that. So on the 21st, uh, we'll give you a report with some options. And if you say push go, um, we'll have some estimates for you and we'll proceed to do that. Um, I would love to have all the security uh, in place for when the building reopens. Um, but given when the province is saying, you know, a little bit at a time, or it's all gonna be open on this particular date, um, there's some um, people flow issues. Um, if you will, to go through this building, uh, which will require the relocation of who sits where. So I just want to make sure that when we come to you and we say this is what we recommend, uh, we do it once and we do it right, that it's going to last for at least the next two years so that um, we can deal with our accommodation issues and whether or not you want to um, um, stay in this building, leave this building, do something on five Huron Street. Um, but that's what we're looking at in the report coming back that uh, I would get direction from council to proceed with what we're recommending. So I I'm hoping you'll be satisfied with the report. More questions? More comments? Not seeing any. Motion that Perth County Council receives the Public Works Activity Report. Moved by Doug Eight, second by you, McDermott. Those in favor? Those in favor? Gary. Okay, we're moving on to the next item, and that would be the tenant results five year and street roof replacement. Are you doing that, John, or is Nick coming on? No, I'm going to do that, Warden Aitchison. Um, but I just want to. I acknowledge my staff here before I get into the tender results. Uh, certainly Nick Larson, Callina Hennigan, and Chuck Blancher have been a tremendous help to me this, this year in, in preparing the tenders, the specifications, and certainly getting these uh, out on uh, the eBids and tenders site. So the next report is tender results for the five Huron Street roof replacement. Uh, in our facilities condition assessment that we had a few years ago, it was noted that the roof at 5 Huron 
which is Service Ontario in there as our tenant. It's well past its lifespan and it's due to be replaced. We had estimated uh, at that time through the assessment uh, at about $80,000 and we included that in our 2020 capital facilities budget. Uh, we do note that uh, we have not had any leaks since around 2017 and we have done some minor repairs just to maintain uh, the lifespan of this roof to date. We closed the tenders on April 14th. We had tremendous uh, uh, amount of submissions, 14 submissions altogether, and bids ranged from a low of $127,912 to a high of $195,464. Uh, these tenders and prices are good for a minimum of 90 days as per the terms and conditions of the tender. The low bid was from Smith Pete Roofing and Sheet Metal Limited. Um, of course, this is certainly considerably over budget, to about 45%. Um, however, if, you know, just for council's information, if this project is cancelled uh, and retendered at a later date, it's unlikely that we're going to see uh, lower prices here, given the number of submissions and the pricing of this work. This, these uh, tender results are, are really a true cost uh, of the project. Um, so if, if we are to re-tender this in, in the future or, or redo it, uh, we wouldn't expect to get anything lower. Um, you know, certainly we've been talking about a number of things and, and the request from council to investigate and report back on options for the courthouse campus in the county's administrative offices. And as Laurie has alluded to, that report will be coming uh, at the next council meeting. Uh, some of those options, however, do include the renovation or an addition to 5 Huron Street. And until council really has this uh, information before them, it's a little hard to make an informed decision in regard to our buildings. And so our recommendation at this point in time is to defer this roof replacement project. So as I said, we do have 90 days. Um, that should give us plenty of time, at least to get information to council. And just to note that you would have to make a decision on this uh, by the July 2nd, 2020 council meeting, whether we move forward or cancel it. Um, the roof is still in poor condition. We do have a potential risk for further water infiltration. However, I think we, we think we can mitigate those risks by, again, due diligence and increased inspections. Um, so again, just uh, we had only included uh, 80,000 in the, in the budget for this project, and the low bid is $127,912. Any questions? Questions for John. Not seeing any. Uh, John and I talked about this earlier. Um, the one thing I asked John was because the cost of doing a flat roof replacement was so high that perhaps maybe we should look into perhaps uh, putting some roof trusses on there, removing the electrical equipment and slapping some steel up and it'd be fixed once and for all instead of having to mess around with it every few years. So well, that's another reason maybe perhaps for the deferral as well is maybe there is another option. Anyway, and it may be maybe a second story. We'll see what comes back. Do I have, I have a motion here. Perth County Council receives the tender results, five years street roof replacement. Public Works Facility 2020 report and the Perth County Council defers awarding the contract for the five year street roof replacement. Do I have a mover? Todd, second by Walter. Those in favor? That would be carried. Grant, we're moving on to 10 results 112, 113. Thank you, Warden Nathanson. Um, Guess maybe a, a little bit of good news before the bad news report. Uh, um, included in our 2020 Capital Roads budget was the cold in place recycling and hot mix asphalt for Perth Road 112 
and Perth Road 113. Um, altogether, we were looking at about 11 and a half kilometers of roadway there. Uh, this project also includes uh, intersection alignment realignment work at uh, the intersection of Perth Road 112 and Line 29, and also at Perth Road 113 and Line 29. We'll also take this opportunity to do a vertical grade adjustment on Perth Road 112, just south of Line 29, and that's to improve our sight distance uh, on that particular roadway. We had budgeted uh, for both projects a total of uh, 2.205 million. Uh, we we did separate tenders for the recycling and the hot mix asphalt. And it should be noted that Perth East and Perth South have joined in both tenders. So they'll be doing, I guess, some of the first recycling work here by some of our townships. Uh, um, and that's on Perth East Line 29 and Perth South Line 20. And with the hot mix tender, St. Mary's also jumped in there as well. So just to note, uh, joint tendering has been successful uh, in the past for economies of scale. Our tender for cold and place recycling closed on April 7th and we had three bid submissions. Low bid was Labus contracting in the amount of $1,511,155.40 plus HST. Uh, just so council is aware, the high bid was uh, 1.88 million and the second bid was 1.55 million. The county is very familiar with the low bidder and they have previously performed recycling work for the county with very good results. Our hot mix tender closed on April 20th and we had six bid submissions. Low bid was Brant Co Construction in the amount of $1,844,918 plus HST. And should note that this bid is significantly less than the second lowest submission, which was $2,362,000. Our high bid uh, with this uh, was $3 million. Uh, so what I've done is I've broken down uh, in these tables here, just the amounts that uh, the county uh, the cost to the county, Perth East, Perth South, and the town of St. Mary's within this total project. We should note that the low bidder has not performed uh, road paving work for the county previously. And so we did reach out to other municipalities for references, and uh, they have indicated the contractor's work to be satisfactory. So we included a total of 2,205,500,000 for the construction of Perth Road 112 and 113. Uh, under these two contracts um, and with the, the work that our county forces are gonna be doing, we expect that the total project cost to be $2,095,510 and that includes our, count, our county's portion of HST. Um, I guess I, I should note that, uh, it, it is very important to note that the pricing submitted is based on unit rates and they're not fixed prices. So the contract may vary depending on the actual quantities that are laid down as, as far as asphalt or, or recycling. Also, uh, the asphalt cement commodity prices are somewhat volatile. And uh, since around 2007, uh, most municipalities carry a clause in their tender and in their contracts that uh, is a, a AC adjustment clause. And this just sort of protects not only the municipality, but also the contractor if there is big swings in, in the price of AC. And so when, when we go out to tender with these jobs, we're sort of guessing, a, a, but it's an educated guess uh, we, we have a lot of contacts that we, we get this information from, but we're, we're picking a price where what we think the, the price of uh, asphalt cement will be in that month when, when we're getting construction done. Should that price uh, vary significantly, this clause sort of allows for the uh, either additional payment to the contractor 
or less cost to the municipality, uh, depending on if it's higher or lower. So just uh, the county will be administering this contract on behalf of the other municipalities. Um, I do know that both Perth East and Perth South have approved their portions of the project. And I think St. Mary's is taking their work uh, to count their council uh, shortly here. So if any of those quantities need to be admitted though, we can do so uh, without compensation to the contractor. And I'd be happy to answer any questions with this project. Bob? Thanks, John, and that's great pricing, I think. Uh and I don't have an issue with uh, labor's contracting. They've always done good work. Uh, this Branco uh, company, I have a concern with them being almost half a million dollars or their boats below. Uh, what do, do you put in place to guarantee the AC quality of the asphalt that they're going to uh, lay down? And uh, how quick do you get results back? Uh, to ensure we're getting uh, what we expect. Right. Um, well, I guess first and foremost, we certainly had a few concerns when we saw the pricing there as well. And so I can tell you that I did phone Brant Co and, and talk to their um, staff there just to make sure that they understood the bid and the, and the clauses in the tender uh, that we did have an AC adjustment clause, uh, which in itself basically provides a, a level playing field, if you will, um, for all bids. Uh, it, your bid price is based on, on that price of AC. Uh, the, and there is no opt-out uh, for, for that clause. So they fully understood. Um, they understand the minimum AC content that we expect in our mixed design. And yes, we do do a quality control testing. Um, so both the, the asphalt producer, um, the company will be doing, they do their own uh, quality control work as well. And then we do some QA work with a, uh, a consulting engineer just to, um, ensure that the quality of asphalt is there. So I did check in with, with Brandt Co and, and they're fully aware. Um, I guess <laughs> they're, I don't think they wanted to leave that much money on the table uh, as well, but I think that's a real, this is a real indication. This, um, this particular area in the market here, we, we tend to see some variation in prices and um, you, you know, I guess we've benefited here. Um, you know, th it's very aggressive pricing and, and we're going to do, we do everything we can, whether it's uh, high priced asphalt or, or low price asphalt, as in this case, we always do our due diligence and ensuring quality control of the product. Bob? Um. Okay, John, you uh, didn't quite answer the question though. Uh, will you uh, be taking samples off the back of the truck, for example, to ensure the quality is there? And how soon uh, will you get that report back from the tests? And what is the ramifications if it does not meet the quality that we expect? Yeah, those uh, tests are, are done um, and samples are taken. The, we don't get results back uh, right away. That can take uh, in, in the area of, of weeks to get some of these results back. So uh, the asphalt is already down um, when, when we get results. Uh, if there is issues with the, the quality and the specs within the testing, then, then yeah, we're going back to the contractor and, and going through the different options of of how they might rectify that. So um, in the past, you know, like whether it's, uh, they have to mill it off and, and repave it, or uh, it'll just depend on on what uh, what the situation is. Walter, do you have a question? Yeah, I just uh, want to know, um, John, um, they obviously, uh, or I would assume they provided some references 
Um, did you have an opportunity to uh, to check references or other other jobs that they had done and and uh, um, comments from from those particular jobs? Yes, uh, I, that's what I uh, included in my report. There, we did we did call around to other municipalities who who this company has done road work for, and and again, um, I all the work that they've done is satisfactory. Um, I do know their the supervisor for this particular company worked for another asphalt company who's done a lot of work for us, Perth County. So I'm familiar with their uh, their superintendent, and uh, um, you know I'm again I I don't I don't find anything here that uh, other than the fact that we haven't done any work ourselves with them. I, I haven't come across any red flags uh, as far as their workmanship. Other questions, Daryl? Uh, you guys can all hear me. I'm on the phone now. Yeah, good to go. Yeah, I, I have to agree with Bob there. I see these numbers, and as all of you know by now, uh, paving and road building is <laughs> a tough one for me, and I. I've seen it mixed up and I've seen it good and I've seen it in the center and it, yeah, half a million dollars there. Um, oh man, I just hope the quality is there. I, I hope we do some sampling of pavement. A couple of those other boys there in the center there, those are some reputable road builders. They do excellent work. I know this. Um, yeah it is it is money though and i get that and you're saying satisfactory john is what you hear and i i hope that's on the high side of satisfactory um it's concerning to me still as i sit here i i will say that and we go forward though money is money i i do understand and we have to reach outside with new contractors and give them a shot okay thanks other questions, yeah. John? Maybe further to that, uh, all of our paving projects, uh, and I know Councillor Wilhelm has stated about the quality control testing. We've we've always done quality control testing on all of our paving jobs. Uh, uh, maybe that you know it's another thing uh, why we're doing joint tenders as well as perhaps uh, at, at certain levels that type of testing was not done on, on some roadways. So that's always been part of our program. Um, yes, results aren't immediate. Um, and, and, you know, we haven't had a lot of uh, instances where we've had bad quality control tests come back. So, um, you know, good supervision on these, these capital projects is, is necessary. Um, we we have that, um, and you know I have full confidence uh, that we have the staff and we have the contractors that uh, will ensure we have a good product. Other questions or comments? Not seeing any. I have a motion. That Perth County receives the tender results for Perth Road 112 report and that Perth County Award Contract 2020 30 03 Pullman Place Recycling to Labus Contracting Limited in the amount of $1,511,155.50 plus HST. And that council awards the contract for the 2020 031 04 hot mix paving pavement to Brantco Construction in the amount of $1,844,918 plus HST. Do I have a mover? That would be Bob Wilhelm. A seconder is Hugh McDermott. Any more comments or questions before I bring her to a vote? Those in favor? Yeah, Passed. Good. Thank you. Move on to the bad news, John. Well, I'm hoping to bring a little silver lining at the end of this as well, but 
Uh, yeah, the next report here, tender results for Perth Line 86. And again, in our 2020 capital roads budget, we had uh, set aside uh, or estimated uh, $1,089,500 for the reconstruction of Perth Line 86 from Perth Road 131 east to Dorking. Uh, this road is a boundary road with Wellington County. And we had also included in this stretch, uh, uh, there was a culvert, re, or pardon me, a bridge rehab, uh, and we included 201,000 in our, our bridge and culvert uh, capital program here for, for that work. Um, this, these estimates uh, and what was in the budget is uh, representative of Perth County's 50% of the total project costs. Uh, Wellington County is administering this contract and they issued a tender which included both the road construction work, which was uh, cold in place recycling and hot mix asphalt, and also the bridge rehabilitation work. Um, I've noted some of the approximate quantities in this particular contract and, uh, and the work that's involved with the bridge rehab. Well, it closed the tender on April 14th, and there was five bid submissions, and I've listed them for, for council there in, within the report. Low bid was Steeton Evans Limited in the amount of $3,669,000 plus HST. This course is uh, significantly over budget. Um, we budgeted that... Um, or our portion of this tendered amount would be $1,834,500. We had only budgeted a, a combination, a total of $1,290,500, which would be 544,000 over budget for just for our half of the project alone. Um, so when I did get tender results, uh, my uh, was reaching for my blood pressure pills, uh, and some aspirin, but uh, you know, I took a took a better look at uh, the tender results, the the line items, and the portions of of the bid submissions here, and uh, had a little better understanding of of why we're so over budget. Um, some of that might be my uh, estimating skills. Uh, I like to think I do a pretty good job, but uh, per, this one here has obviously a little light. Uh, the one thing, though, is when we look at uh, the bridge rehab uh, portion of this project, we had estimated a total of 402000 to do the bridge rehab. And within the bid submission, the bridge work totaled just uh, under $650,000, which is about two hundred and fifty dollars over budget. Um, going through the, that uh, those tender results, I can't find any sort of specific line item or quantity within within that uh, that would uh, indicate why it was such this project was uh, or the bridge was so over budget. Uh, I think everything was uh, prices were a little bit higher. I will note that uh, the submission by Steed and Evans for the bridge work was the lowest of the five submissions. If we look at the road work alone, uh, that portion of the tender was just over $3 million. Uh, right away, there was a provisional item in this, in this tender for blended shoulder gravel. So right off the hop, um, this total project will be lowering by approximately $185,000. Um, and then uh, of course, they have a payment adjustment formula for their asphalt cement also within the tender. And what Wellington used was $900 per tonne of liquid asphalt. Uh, in, my, in my tenders, I had used 800, uh, certainly in the one that uh, just reported on previously for 112 and 113. This is uh, when, we, when we pick these numbers, we're just doing you know, I'm phoning up guys in the uh, hot mix producers uh, in the AC business and trying to get a handle on where we think uh, AC prices are going. It's, 
we never really know what it is. We're just trying to do our best to job of, of picking that price. Um, I've gone with eight hundred dollars tone. Wellington County went with nine hundred. Um, that could mean if if uh, I'm a little more correct, uh, went, um, then there's going to be a significant savings on the uh, on the hot mix asphalt and even the recycling here if that uh, if that AC index is less than nine hundred dollars. Um, as I said, it is volatile, but uh, depending on where it is, uh, this has the potential to lower the overall price of the project by about $80,000. Also, when I look at their asphalt quantities that they included in the tender, uh, they have been very conservative with their, with their estimate numbers. Um, they had uh, almost 20,000 tones, and in my estimate, I had looked at 18,000 tones uh, for, for, for hot mix. Um, our total project costs will only be based on the actual asphalt laid. So in discussions with Wellington County, I'm, I'm fairly confident that uh, um, my estimate for, for the amount of asphalt is correct. And, and if I am, uh, then that would lower the overall project cost by about $150,000. Uh, the bid price for cold in place recycling was above our unit price that I used in the budget estimate. Uh, recycling work came in on this bid, bid submission of $637,000. Uh, our estimate was $520,000. And also with the hot mix, uh, the average hot mix asphalt price on this particular project is $81 a ton. Um, just to give you a comparison, the unit price for hot mix on the previous report, Perth Road 112 and 113, was $58 a tone. Mm -hmm. So there's a considerable difference there. And, and of course, uh, asphalt is the most costly item in any of these projects. And in this particular one, it is about 1.6 million. Um, that's approximately 300K over our estimate. So I'm projecting that overall project costs will likely be in around the 3.255 million, which is still um, a total of 675,000 over the total project estimate. I did discuss these results and potential options with Wellington County. Um, it's our opinion that we wouldn't, if we were to retender this or cancel the project and retender at a later date, you're not going to see any significant uh, cost savings in this project if it's retendered. Uh, one thing we could do though is uh, is delay the surface course asphalt until 2021. And uh, that, that portion of the bid is uh, $780,000. Again, this isn't going to lower the overall project cost, but it would shift some of those costs over to 2021. So based on our projections uh, uh, for overall project costs, uh, Perth County's portion of the project would be 1.627 uh, million plus HST. Um, we had had uh, 1,290,500,000 budgeted. That's about 337,000 over budget. Um, we have, in all of our projects here, we have gas tax uh, funding uh, um, allotted to all of our, our projects, uh, and same within this case. I think uh, one thing I want to make, uh, I am recommending that we proceed with this project. Uh, um, not an easy recommendation to make when we're so over budget. However, I think... Uh, we, uh, when we look at the totality of our contracts this year, and I just opened up tender results for Perth Line 36, and um, I'm happy to report that anticipate will be about 200,000 below budget on that project. So I think if we look at all, all of our road projects this year, what we've had budgeted, uh, when it comes down to it, 
we're probably going to be pretty close um, to to that budget number if we look at it as a whole. I'd be happy to answer any questions in regard to this report. Questions for John? I don't see any hands going up. I got a question for you, John. Have you got the latest last uh, month index? The last one I got was March and it was $767. I assume it's gone up a bit from then. I just checked this morning and I believe April's was posted and it's around 700 and close to $760. So that's actually down a little bit from March. Yeah. Um, this, this fluctuates. Um, you know, I anticipated it being in around the $800 mark uh, come the summertime. Again, you know, how much is COVID going to affect? I, I know it's a COVID's affecting some of these tendered prices that you're seeing right now. Contractors have admitted to me that that there is you're seeing an increase in cost because of that. Um, I don't have an exact percentage of what that might be, uh, but certainly how they do their work is. Um, they they they're going to be incurring some extra costs as well. So, how this is going to affect the AC market uh, is in, is anyone's guess. Um, I think my guess is about as good as anybody's. Um, and you know, I, I do know 2019 there wasn't a big fluctuation in the AC prices throughout the year. 2018. Um, it ranged from like $880 to $580 a tone over that in, within that year. So some significant swings in, 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 that, uh, in that price. And that's just part of the, uh, the things you have to deal with when, when navigating through these projects and estimating for them. Looks like right now we're around about 100 bucks less than last year on the AC, if that's the price today. I just looked right. at all my, you, my report from the last time. Could you repeat that, Jim? We're running about $100 less on the AC than we were this time last year. That's correct. Last year uh, in May, it was $860 for AC. Correct. OK, so I have a motion here. Perth County receives the tender results line 86 report and Perth County support the awarding of the Wellington County contract CW 2020-010 to Steed and Evans Limited in the amount of $3,669,000 plus HST. Moved by. That would be Matt Duncan and Daryl Hurley. Those in favor, that would be carried. Oh, great. Perfect. Okay. Moving on. Thanks, John. Council Thanks, report. Jim, Jim I have a yeah. question for John. Yeah. Uh, John, on Tuesday, we received word that, uh, um, and as you're, as you're no doubt aware, we share the way on line with Luke and Badal. Uh, we received word that, um, Middlesex County is taking over uh, Luke and Badal's share of the whale mine, uh, which was kind of surprising. Um, have you heard any of this or, or uh, should uh, Perth County be looking at taking over the other portion or, or what's the steps on that? Yes, uh, through the warden, uh, thank you, Counts Councillor Wilhelm. Um, I, I am aware of that. Uh, um, Ken Bettles has uh, informed me of that the other week. So, I yeah, that's a portion of road, I believe, uh, west of Highway 23 and uh, was is boundary, a boundary road with Perth South and Luke and Bidolf. I believe Luke and Bidolf was responsible for the maintenance on that particular roadway. I think with Middlesex County, um, they they have something where if the, don't quote me on this, but I believe if the traffic count is above a thousand vehicles per day, then that portion of roadway would be considered for uploading to the, at the county level. 
And so I think that's what's happened in this case. Um, I'm not sure what the traffic volumes are on the rest of Wayland Line. Um, and if that might be looked at in, in the future as well. So um, we haven't, uh, I don't think we've, we've ever really established anything like that within Perth County, but I think, you know, we'd certainly be open to, um, you know, talking about that and, and should, uh, that would make the road a class two roadway. And, and those are some things that we could, we could have discussions on is should uh, you know class three roadways be uploaded to the county level and say any class four roadways remain at uh, a township level that kind of thing so um, yes I am aware of this and uh, we are looking for more information and criteria as to how that's going to proceed any other questions for John uh, further follow up. Um, if county, if Middlesex County has a policy on on the uploading of roads, is that something we should look at and uh, develop uh, also? That uh, because I'm pretty sure we've got a couple roads that uh, should not be county roads. So I think maybe we should uh, see what their policy is and and perhaps uh, Perth County develop a policy too. Yeah, we'd be happy to look into that. And uh, that would be part of this uh, process as, uh, as as these roads sort of get uploaded here. Other questions? Not seeing any. Council reports. Anybody got anything on there? Do I have, we have a bylaw. And I'm going to read it off of this, actually. Mm -hmm. The bylaw number 3756-2020, a bylaw to appoint clerk and deputy clerk, and to repeal bylaw 3642-2017, whereas section 228-1 of the Municipal Act 2001 as amended provides that a municipality shall appoint a clerk and where as the clerk shall have the powers, rights and duties prescribed by the, for the clerk by the Municipal Act 2001 as amended and any other statute and whereby the Municipal Act 2001 provides a municipality to a, may appoint a deputy clerk who has all the powers and duties of the clerk. And now, now therefore that the Council of the Corporation of the County of Perth enacts as follows that Tyler Sager be appointed as clerk as of May 7th, 2020, that Lori Wolf be appointed as deputy clerk as of May 7th, 2020, and that bylaw 3642 passed on December 21st, 2017, be hereby repealed, that this bylaw shall come into force and effect on May 7th, 2020, read a first, second, and third time on May, the seventh day of May, 2020. Do I have a mover? That would be Todd and that'd be second by you. Those in favor? All carry. Great. Uh, notice the motions? Other business? Uh, Walter first. I've got a couple, but Walter's first. Okay, um, just uh, I guess it's maybe more of a comment than anything, and, and uh, uh, certainly um, I was maybe a little skeptical at first with the uh, ECG meetings that we've had on the Mondays, but it's worked out quite well, and uh, I'm glad. Uh, I think at this point in time we can meet uh, um, every other week, and, and that has uh, uh, been agreed to by the by the sounds of it. I guess. Um, from a, from a group perspective, uh, I kind of enjoy uh, uh, finding out what's happening in, in the other areas throughout the county. And I was a little disappointed that one of our partners decided to uh, not participate through the whole thing on last Monday. And I hope that was a one-off because it's a shame. Um, I just like to know what's, what's going on across the whole county as opposed to uh, in, in a few areas. So that's my point. 
Todd, do you have a comment? Uh, if you're asking me to respond to um, Walter's uh, question. You had your hand up before. Sorry? You had your hand up earlier on. Uh, yes, I did. Um, I just wanted to ask a question, actually, uh, which is pertaining to uh, whether our committees are able to conduct business using electronic uh, technologies at this point, whether we've enabled that through bylaw. Uh, through the warden, yes, we, we could resume the committee work if that's uh, if that's the direction you want to go for now. We could. Well, some committees have gone on. Yeah, the, the planning, planning committee has been working along. So, yes, the um, um, uh, municipal day committee uh, met last week. So we we can do it. Yeah, we we did it when we changed the bylaw. Box yes. Yeah, that's March. for council and committees. Yes. Yeah, it, it included council and committees at that time. Yes. Perfect. I got a thumbs up on that. Any other announcements or anything? Doug Height. Just you said you're going to talk to the province tomorrow, right? Well, Every I, Friday. I'm not all of them. But do, you, do, you, do you get any satisfaction? Um, like I know I can open up my my uh, flower stop tomorrow and my hardware store Saturday to ten people. We only have right now thirteen people. Um, can you ask Pet a piece or whoever you might talk to? Council, like the planning, I'm getting a lot of planning calls. I got one, Perth South made a planning decision to sever a, an old barn by the train tracks. And for some reason, Bob will know who called me. Guy calls me and says, how can they do that? I said, I don't know. I'm not from Perth South. You know who the guy is. Jim knows too. He's smiling. His name's uh, Uncle Jack. I, so, I know uh, I know what you're referring to. And it, it actually wasn't necessarily a, mo uh, a severance to sever a barn from a property. It was to sever a piece of property for which a house will be built on the barns coming down. Right. Well, he knows that. He knows it's Uncle Jack Wolf. He just wonders how his is held up. We got to get the planning going, I think. And I think well, they could meet in person. Was, uh, your Uncle Jack's has already been approved to go to land division. We're just and waiting for to go through. Yeah. Land we division doesn't work. Response from Minister Clark about three weeks ago on that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if Walter got any. And they were going to forward us the details how we were going to be able to do that in the next two weeks. And I've heard nothing since. Nothing. Daryl? Yeah, no, thanks, Doug. And this is where I become concerned, frustrated, and everything. You know, we are opening things up, and there seems to be some lallygagging in different areas. And it's quite confusing and disheartening, to be honest, how they go about it. Uh, I it, it's bizarre in my mind. I'll leave it at that. But yeah, if you're talking with them, yeah, we 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 can get this planning going. Thank you. We are working on it, but you gotta the one thing you have to remember when it comes to planning, it will have to be a public meeting. I know. Still have rights. Yeah. So that is the biggest hold up. Is to make sure you can have Anybody who wants, and Sally alluded to it earlier on, yeah. anybody who wants to comment have to be able to comment. Whether they're Yes, I understand that. Yes. Yeah. And, and maybe they will open it up and we'll see. My biggest problem with when the province opens something up like Doug's going to be able to sell flowers tomorrow, uh, they, they don't really define what they're saying. Yeah. There's always such a gray area, no. and that went back to the landscaping thing. There's always so many gray areas, nobody really truly knows. And if you phone Toronto, they can't really tell you for sure either. No, it's disheartening for oh. sure. Yeah. Any other announcements, questions, comments? Not seeing any. I have a confirmatory bar law. Uh, to be uh, here, it is right here. No. Nope. Yeah. Just gotta make sure I got the right one. But bylaw 3757 2020. You read a first, second, and third time and passed May 7, 2020. Moved by. That would be Rhonda, second by Doug I. Those in favor? That would be carried. Thank you very much. I need a motion to adjourn.
Moved by Doug Kellum, second by Matt Duncan. Those in favor? Pass. Thank you for your indulgence and patience. This is a little tiny bit slower periodically, but we got it done. So thank you very much. Uh, Rhonda? No, did you want to go over the recovery no, thing? No, no we're, we're good. We're good. Forget about it. <laughs>